Good evening, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to the Granada Forum on this November 3rd, 2005. Tonight, we're going to have Mr. Bill Thornton, who's going to talk about, well, he represents the Nitty Gritty Law School. He's going to talk about all kinds of different things in the law. So without any further introduction, let me introduce you to a wonderful man, Mr. Bill Thornton. Here's the secret mic. Okay, well, we're going to talk about republic versus democracy and how it affects your sovereignty as an individual. Now, basically, <clears throat> before I really get into that, I want to talk about, uh, about the uh, system that we're in. You see, when the Founding Fathers put together this Constitution, they uh, had it up to their eyeballs with authority. They saw the abuses, they saw the, the murders, they saw the, uh, uh, the robberies and so on that was done by the English military. Okay? They saw how the military would just simply move into somebody's home because they wanted it. You know? And uh, so they tried to put together a system that would endure, that would preserve your freedoms. And uh, so they, they basically said, look, we're self-governing. Self-government means you tell, what you, what, you tell you what to do. And not, you're not governed by anybody. You are governed by yourselves. The only limitation on your self-government is that you cannot govern yourself in such a way that you take away from the sovereignty of someone else. And as long as you stay within that limitation, well then you mind your own business, they'll mind their own business. That's kind of the, the general theme. But they also recognized that there were a couple of uh, power structures out there that they had to contend with. There was England, France, Spain, Mexico, all of them would love to take over the United States, or at least it wasn't known as the United States then, but they would like to take them over. So in order to have a force that would meet their force, uh, they put together this government, and the whole idea was to have a government that was big enough, strong enough to protect us from the outside world, while at the same time having no authority to deal with the people themselves. We, the people, had the common law, and the common law worked well. Everybody knew it. As a matter of fact, there was a, an admiral that said that he had a real problem in prosecuting people. A couple of reasons. One of them is, is by, by night, they were out doing things against the British government, and by day, they were sitting on the grand juries. <laughs> and another problem was, is that everybody in the United States is a lawyer. The English uh, law, uh, bookstores sold more law books to America than they sold on the British Isles. We, the people, really took this whole idea of law seriously. The tremendous percentage of us knew and understood the system we were living in, and knew and understood the common law. Well, of course, that's a tough thing to deal with for bureaucrats. So uh, after the Constitution was put together, uh, they managed to sneak through a little item called the 14th Amendment. And the 14th Amendment created a new class of human being called citizen of the United States. And you look, it's a very clear definition. It, it very clearly says that if you are born in the United States or naturalized and subject to the jurisdiction, then you're a citizen of the United States. Now, you can be born or naturalized, but not subject. What would you be then? Well, you'd be one of the people. Okay, because the people own the government, and the government owns the citizens. So they also took over in the 1850s the school system. So uh, the very first mandatory school system, now there were public schools, okay, but not many. Most of them were private because we were an agrarian society, and the farmers got together and hired a teacher. But we, uh, uh, the government couldn't stand all that education. So what they did... They uh, had a few public schools, but the first mandatory public school was 
set up in around 1850 or so, and it was populated under military supervision. The parents didn't want the kids to go to that kind of school, and they forced the issue. Of course, I think it was illegal, but you know, when you're talking raw power, it's pretty hard to resist. And why was it so important to the government? Because once they got command of the schools, setting the curriculum, then from the 1850s to the 1950s, over a 100-year period, they phased out the subject of civics and replaced it with a new subject called American government. So when you and I went to school, we learned American government. What is civics? If you look it up in the dictionary, civics is specifically that branch of political philosophy dealing with personal rights. So you drop civics, you bring in that branch of political philosophy dealing with government, and you have a bunch of people who are no longer ignorant, I mean, no longer knowledgeable uh, about their rights. When I was a kid, somebody once told me that the two most important subjects to learn in school, beating everything else, the first one was English, and the second one was civics. And at that time, I had not a clue, but somehow it stuck in my mind, and now I understand it. Yeah, if you don't know what your rights are, you can't protect them, and what good is the rest? And how are you going to understand it unless you handle the, the, the English language well? If you don't have good command of the English language, you've got a problem. You've got to learn how to spell. You've got to learn how to write. You've got to learn how to read. You've got to learn how to, to uh, uh, detect uh, uh, propaganda and separate it from facts and, and you know, valid thinking and so on. Well, that all comes with the study of English and the study of uh, personal rights. From there, once you have your full rights and once you do have the ability to communicate with others, everything else comes into play. You can do what you choose once you have those two subjects under control. What can you do if you have no rights? Doesn't matter how much English you know. And, and if you have all rights, what does it matter if you can't communicate? If you don't, you know. So you have to have both. And so I have since learned that, yeah, those are the two most important subjects. And I'd like to see civics brought back into the school. No school teaches civics that I know of. Okay, none, anywhere. What you're getting here is a portion of a civics class. Now, if you want the whole thing, talk to Dennis Whipple. Because Dennis has on the website at 1215.org, you go there, and he has a list of some of the past, um, past, um, uh, presentations on the subject. There's an eight-hour presentation for, uh, which covers the subject, subject of sovereignty and a whole bunch of other stuff. And I'd suggest you get that one. And just so you know, I am advertising this, these CDs, uh, but I get no benefit out of it, okay? Whatever you pay, that never goes to my pocket. So, but I am encouraging you to get it because if you, if anybody wants to call me, all I say is, look, you got to watch that first so that we can speak a common language. Until you learn the language that I speak, the legal language, then I'd spend all my time putting on a private seminar. Far better you spend the 20 bucks for the CD and, uh, or DVD, actually, <clears throat> and get, get the information. And it's better presented than I could present it individually because I was prepared on the day I, sent, I, I presented it. Anyhow, <clears throat> this is a labor of love. I want to share the information, and that's why I'm here today, fundamentally. Um, the, uh, <clears throat> we have the foundation here, and this, what you see here, by the way, pretty much reflects what's on the website. And the, DV, the CD that I passed out a few minutes ago is exactly what you see here, except for a couple kind of tiny details. Because you'll notice that on the, on the CD, there's a date. And that's the date that it was created. And uh, if you find somebody else has a, a CD, just look at the date on it too. Because whatever has the latest date, that has the latest information. Okay? So um, some people, like Dennis Whipple, get an advanced copy. I didn't give him one tonight because he has one already that's later. <laughs> Excuse me. Anyhow, so let's go into the foundation. Basically, in the foundation, there's... Uh, um, can everybody see this, this uh, the wording that's up there? Is it large enough for you? Can you see it? Can you see it easily? Or 
would this be better? Is that better? Okay. Want it bigger? Okay. <clears throat> Wise men are instructed by reason, men of less understanding by experience, the most ignorant by necessity, and the beasts are instructed by nature. Anyway, that was uh, by Cicero when he wrote some letters to Atticus. Anyhow, the, uh, the important thing to understand about the law that I, as I present it to you requires thinking. This is not something that you can take a form, fill it in, and expect to get results. You have to be flexible, and when a problem comes up, a legal problem, you've got to be able to shift with the need. And, and you have to reason your way through. Many of the things that we did to get to the point where we were, were done because we reasoned our way to that point. Had we relied on prior case law or prior experience of other people, we wouldn't have made it. Okay? One of the things that you can do when you understand this stuff that's on that CD I gave you is you can go into court and if a judge makes a, a decision, you can create your own order reversing the judge's decision. Okay? And he's subject to it. In one case, we had a judge who didn't get the message. When we issue an order, uh, and I say we because there's other people involved here that have made their contributions, it's not me. It's, uh, I'm just one cog in this wheel. But when we issue an order, uh, we also issue a little mini course in law to explain to the judge why it is that he's number two and the person issuing the order is number one. And when they read it, it's all there, case law, uh, statutory law, common law. It's all there. It explains it all. And by the way, you have an example of an order on that CD that, that you can see how it was done. The, uh, uh, we had one case where the judge was given an order, reversing his order, and he went along for a while. He was good for a while. Then a few months later, he forgot his, his position. And he issued a second order. And it was a serious enough order where he was interfering with the process. And so we issued a second order vacating that order as well. But we didn't stop there. We also fined him for contempt of court. You can do that with a judge. We fined him one dollar. <clears throat> he never paid it. Now, there's a lot of people, if you look at the record, you can see that he never paid it. A lot of people look at that record and without thinking it through will assume, well, so what good did it do to find him in contempt of court? Well, I have to admit it didn't do any good as far as the record shows. But what really happened was that within 30 days after he was found in contempt of court, the presiding judge pulled him off, reassigned him to a dark corner of the county in a small criminal court, and then they brought in their top gun, a, a, a judge who was absolutely expert in the common law, was a member of a judge's group that studied common law. They lived and breathed it. They loved it. It was their hobby. And this guy that they brought in also at one time was the presiding judge of the appellate department of the Superior Court, which this is a guy who writes case law. They don't let guys write case law unless they got their act together and understand the subject. So they brought in their top gun, and they were willing to pull this other judge off of our case and 900 other cases. That's a number given to us by that judge, uh, in order to bring this other judge in. And he just pretended like, well, you know, he's just a replacement judge except we went to, went to the uh, law library and looked up the judicial profile and we found out all this good stuff about him. <laughs> so we knew they brought in their top gun. Didn't make any difference because he wasn't in charge. You know, he has to get in charge before he can issue orders. So he was no more authorized to issue orders than the first guy. But at least he, he was easier to deal with because <laughs> he was educated. You know, so it's, it's hard uh, when you're dealing with ignorance. In fact, there's a philosopher, a German philosopher, uh, named uh, Goethe. And Goethe said 
that there's nothing so fearful as ignorance in action. Okay? And, you know, these judges can do a lot of damage because they have power and not necessarily education. And the lower you go in the judicial system, the worse it gets. God forbid you should ever bring a case before a small claims judge, you know, and, and the municipal court level, which has now been merged into the superior court, but still the, the same judges are there. They're bad too. So you don't get some real education until you start getting into the superior court with a real judge who has been there a while, who's had a chance to go to judges' school. Judges' school is called seminars. That's what they do. So anyway, you have to reason your way through it. Now, the very first order that I ever issued to uh, a judge, I didn't know that this could be done. I just theorized it could be done. So I was plenty scared when I went in. I mean, my, my knees were chattering loud enough, I'm sure, that uh, it was picked up in the recordings. But uh, it, it was scary because my theory, my reasoning process said, hey, I can do this. But I'd never seen it done before. And frankly, I was scared of the judge too. But, and it wasn't even my case, by the way. It was, I was helping somebody. But he under, the person I was helping understood sovereignty. And uh, although he was in jail, he opened up his court, superior court, and he was being held by the municipal court. He did a habeas corpus, and he appointed me as a special master, giving me total authority to uh, take testimony and collect whatever data was necessary to run the court. And uh, as a special master, I started doing research and so on. We filed my authorization papers with the clerk, and uh, I heard a, a, a jailhouse rumor f through the uh, prisoner that there was going to be some sort of hearing on this coming Monday of the next week. So I said, oh, okay. So I had some certified copies of my uh, uh, authorization as a special master. So on Monday morning, I went in extra early, requested to see the judge in chambers, we met in there, and I introduced myself. And by the way, I was dressed like an attorney. You know, I had pinstripe suit, had a vest, tie, no beard, okay? And uh, I went in there, and, and I, he wanted to know why I wanted to see him. And I said, well, I just said that uh, I'd been appointed as a special master in the Superior Court, and um, I was concerned about this certain case. And uh, here's a copy of my, my authorization. And, um, and I, I just wanted to let him know in advance so he wouldn't be surprised that um, I was here to observe the case. And he said, oh, okay, glad he appreciated that, you know, it's a courtesy, okay? I mean, you don't just bomb in on his court and uh, he's accustomed to taking it, you know, having control. You don't just bomb in and say, hey, here I am. I gave him a little time to think about it, you know, what's coming down the pike or ask a question or something informally. As a little side, an aside on this, Another attorney came in, took one look at me, oh, obviously a fellow attorney, and uh, spoke with the judge, started speaking with the judge, and lo and behold, it turned out this other attorney was a district attorney, and he wanted to talk about the very same case. But you know what? He was breaking the law. You see, I was a, I was a neutral party. I was, court, I was an officer of the court, another court, but nevertheless an officer of a court connected to this case, this other attorney was on one side of the advocacy. I was not on one side of the advocacy. I was in the middle as a judicial officer, okay? And, uh, of course, the, the judge was no dummy, and he cut him off real fast. He says, wait a minute. He says, this is getting too complicated. We need to go on the record. He did that right away. So we did. Well, <clears throat> later on when he called the case, I stood up. I walked right up to the, that table had the prosecutor on my left, public defender on the right. Public defender was supposedly representing the defendant, but uh, he wasn't welcome. So <clears throat> I had an opportunity to speak at some point, and uh, the judge looked at me and he said, uh, you know, what do you have to say? And I said, well, I said, uh, I'm William Thornton. And uh, I've been appointed as a special master in the Superior Court of California. And uh, uh, 
there's a habeas corpus proceeding in the Superior Court, and I'm here to observe the proceedings in this case, and, uh, and I'm now declaring the Superior Court of the State of California open and in session. So here we were with one courtroom and two courts. So we went back and forth. We talked a little bit. And the judge said, well, uh, what is it you want of me? Now, that was a trap. I couldn't tell him what I wanted. So I couldn't respond that way. Because I wasn't representing me. I'm representing a higher authority, the court, the sovereign's court. And I'm not sovereign at that point. I'm now working for the court. So I have no sovereignty of my own in this case. So I said to him, I spoke to him using sovereign language, the kind of language a sovereign would use. Now, it, by, by centuries old custom, actually thousands of years, millennium old, the sovereign never issues a direct order. He always issues an indirect quarter, order for one simple reason. When you issue direct orders, sometimes it creates resentment. So as a practical matter, you know, it's an occupational hazard of uh, kings and dictators that they get knocked off, okay? So they soften their orders and they say, it's my wish, my desire. But when a king speaks or a queen speaks, my wish is your command, okay? It may be a wish, it may be softened, but that doesn't take away from the, the effect of the order. So when I was speaking with the judge, and remember, the judge is not sovereign. He's working for a sovereign, just like I'm working for a sovereign, and, although he got paid and I didn't. And I said to him, it is the wish of the superior court that the municipal court release jurisdiction of this matter to the superior court until such time as the issues in the superior court are settled. And he said, I will do that if you will give me the order in writing. And I said, I came here today to observe. I do have a, an order half prepared because I did not know how things would go today. But if you will recess the case, I will complete the order by hand and deliver it to you upon recall. And he said, fine. So he recessed the case, moved on, putting other people in jail. And we went, we went ahead and run around, ran around to different uh, copy machines or whatever, trying to find one that worked and, you know, making copies of the handwritten order that I finished up and so forth. So when he recalled the case, I passed the order up to the marshal who gave it to the judge. And the judge read it into the record. And then he ordered the paper order, the actual written order, filed into the record. And then that was the end of the case for that day. His authority was gone. Now, I'm sure he would have researched it, you know, and I'm sure that had there been something wrong, I would have been in jail, you know, but it never happened, <clears throat> never happened. So, and we got some good results out of that. So that was a long case, so there was more to that big story, but the point I'm pointing out, that was the very first, and we arrived at that point because of the reasoning process. One of the things you have to develop if you're going to be involved in the common law is the ability to say, Two plus three equals what? You've got to figure it out. Because maybe you never saw five before. Okay? You've got to do that. If you, don't, if you can't do that, you're not going to succeed in common law. The whole statutory system is lined up against you. You've got to be perfect. If you have any cracks in your, what you're doing, they'll crowbar it open and run right through that crack. So you've got to have good reasoning, good research, make sure you understand everything. I've seen people copy my work and they would include words, sounded good. I said, why'd you use that word? Well, I don't know, it was there, I copied it. Well, it, every word means something. You know, I try to, when I do my writings, I try to make efficient wording. Every word is there for a reason, a thought that I'm trying to convey. Specifically, to, to tell you where this one example occurred, in our paper it said the law is further decreed here. Well, he had his lawsuit, and he put in his lawsuit, the very first thing, the law is further decreed. So the first question I asked him, well, where did you decree it before so that you're now further decreeing it now? 
Well, it turned out that he hadn't decreed it before, so the word further meant nothing. Since further from where? You're at the starting point now. So we took the word further out, you know, before he got the papers filed. But this is what you have to be careful of. You've got to understand that every word, what does it mean? If you don't know what it means, don't just use it. Okay? Well, anyhow, so it's important that I just want you to get, what I want you to get out of this is that you have to have a reasoning process. You have to think things through. So then you get into language and dictionaries. You know, there's different, we speak three different languages in America. Okay? We speak, uh, th by the way, all three are called English. Okay? Now, when you went to school, you learned two of the languages. You haven't learned the third English language. Okay? The first language that you learn, even before you go into school, is called slang. Okay? The second English language that you learn is called formal English. And this is what they teach you in the schools. The third language that's called English, they never teach you. It's called legal English. And when, student, when, when attorneys go to school, they're not aware of that. They're taught different things, but they're not really informed that they're learning a new language. And they come in with misconceptions, and they carry them when they leave. And judges, you know, when, when, you, when you go before a judge, and you say something, and you misstate it, or it what's going to happen, you're going to bring in contradicting things without even knowing it. Well, you create confusion, don't you? Now, the judges get trained in this stuff. They don't, you know, a judge doesn't just get to be a judge arbitrarily. You know, they, they do what they can to keep dummies out, although not always successfully. But they get, they get trained, and when you provide a conflicting thought and you never straighten it out, he's going to make choices, isn't he? He's going to try and figure it out. And as long as there's confusion there, he's going to use what's called discretion. And the discretion of the judges is what really kills the system. And so he'll use his discretion. And you ever, by the way, you ever heard anybody use the term sovereign citizen? You've all heard that term. Well, what does that mean? Well, a sovereign is a master and a citizen is a slave. What's a master slave? Okay. Is it the supervising slave? I don't know. You know, so if you go into court and you claim you're a sovereign citizen, you've created confusion, a conflict of ideas. The judge is going to sit there and he's going to make a choice. Well, which is it? Is he, is he sovereign or is he a citizen? Well, it must be a citizen. And he'll go for it on that basis. And so you, you sabotage your whole citizen or sovereign position if that's what you do. So you have to be careful in your words, really see what they mean. So, as you might guess, I do not support the idea of calling oneself a sovereign citizen. Okay? All right. So, you have to pick, are you one of the people, and all people are automatically sovereign? Or are you going to be one of the citizens? And all citizens are automatically slaves. They're publicly owned slaves. They're not privately owned. Okay? They're owned by the government. Because that's what the Constitution says. It doesn't say it in the language I just said it. What the Constitution says is that if you are born or naturalized and subject to the jurisdiction, then you're a citizen of the United States in the U.S. Constitution. Okay, so subject, you see, people are not subject. See, there is no authority of the government to do anything with the, the people. The people ordained and established this Constitution for whom? For those guys over there called the United States of America, the world's smallest country, it's only 10 miles square, and it lives in Washington, D.C., okay? And it can't go into any of the states without the permission of the state legislature, okay? Of course, they've been putting out a lot of permissions lately, but you see, the, 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 uh, the United States of America is actually a very tiny country in terms of land area, the actual country, which is District of Columbia. It's a very large country in terms of how many people it employs and how much money it spends and that type of thing. So, uh, the people ordained and established this Constitution for the United States of America. That's what it says right in the uh, uh, declaration, in the uh, preamble. So, the preamble, you, you, you know, when you ordain or establish, there's nothing about the words ordaining and establishing that says they gave up anything. They were sovereign before the United States of America existed. And when they created this thing, 
they're sovereign afterwards because the word ordain means to authorize and the word establish means to actually put it on paper, to write it. So if you ordain something, authorize it, and then you create it, where do you see in there that you gave up your authority or your, your sovereignty? You're above whatever you created. You're above whatever you authorized. The, the, the slave cannot turn around and take over the master because you, our slave is called the government. That's what it should be. They're, they're there to serve us. It, and it says so right in the uh, preamble. So we're sovereigns. Now, the next thing is, is, is uh, law. There's several kinds of law, okay? But I break it down in two grand uh, categories. The two grand categories are this. On the one side, we have common law. That's the law of the people. That's the law of you and me. It's custom and usage. It's not written. It's whatever we think it is. Common law pretty much boils down to whatever you convince a jury of. Okay? When you, when you do a lawsuit, you decree what the law is, and then the jury sits in judgment of your law. Now, my, best, my most fun example, my best example is this. When I put together the lawsuit, there's a section in the lawsuit that says I decree the law, or the law is decreed as follows. I keep the personalities out of it. But I'm signing it at the bottom, so you know it's coming from me. The law is decreed as follows. Or I might say the law of the case is as follows. But the idea is, is that I'm creating the law. Now, I, there is one law that I have. It's very personal to me, very important to me. It's so important that if anybody violates this law, there's a death penalty. Okay? So don't violate this law in front of me. Okay? And that law is this. I cannot stand anybody who has pink shoes in my presence. Okay? I know it's a tough law, but this is important to me. Now, if anybody does wear pink shoes in my presence, then I'm going to prosecute them. And I'll bring charges, and I'll, I'll state what the law is, I'll state what the penalty is, and that person, if he chooses, now he may have confidence in my ability to judge, in which case I'll be happy to judge him. But if he doesn't have confidence in my ability to judge, he can always call for a jury. Now, I, I kind of pose this rhetorical question to you. What's the probability of me being able to have on my court a jury that would agree with my law? Okay, probably a low probability. Now, that doesn't mean I've given up. <laughs> I'm determined to prosecute everybody who, who uh, wears pink shoes in my presence. But I haven't given up. Now, it's very similar to what the state does. Take a typical traffic ticket. The state accuses, the state co prosecutes, and the state judges, and the state executes the judgment. And because they've taken away the jail time, you know, because it's an infraction, no, no, there's no jail time associated with infractions, okay? Because they've take, they call it an infraction, that really makes it civil. They like to say it's quasi-criminal, but it's not. It's civil, okay? And uh, it, there's no jury allowed, okay? So <clears throat> that, that's how they play that game. Well, that's all I'm doing too. Okay, I got my law, I accuse, I prosecute, and I'll carry out the execution if necessary. Okay? But the, so the, 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 the jury will stop me if they think, if they do their job and they sit in judgment of not only the facts, but also the law. Sure, there's no doubt the evidence will be there. The person did, in fact, wear pink shoes in my presence. But, the law is no good according to the jury, okay? Now, reverse the situation, go to the other extreme. I also have another law, and th this is what the law is basically, that if I'm walking down the street on a sidewalk, totally minding my own business, nobody around as far as I know, I'm just walking down the sidewalk, and suddenly a person attacks me from behind, knocks me down, perhaps breaks a bone or two, and my law says if anybody does that to me, assuming I don't die, that uh, he needs to be fined $1,000 and go to jail for 30 days. And I could prosecute him on that under the common law, 
what do you think the chances are I'd find a jury that would say, hmm, yeah, that makes sense. You're going to jail. Very high, right? The founding fathers had a belief, a confidence in people, in you and me. Yeah, one of us might have a kooky idea about what the law should be. Not that I'm admitting the pink shoe law is a kooky one, okay? But if some, one of us has a kooky idea, you've got the jury which levels out our society. You ever tried to get 12 people to agree exactly on something? That's not an easy task. And so they had this confidence, this belief, that if we make the highest law of the land the common law, that that will do more than anything else, anything we could regulate through a legislature. And this shows up in the Seventh Amendment. You look at the Seventh Amendment of the Constitution of the United States, it says right there that any decision by a jury is not reviewable in any court. Okay? Not even the Supreme Court can second-guess the jury. It's right there in the Seventh Amendment. Go back and read it. You'll see it. Okay? So the, uh, uh, that is the primary legal system. There's only one problem with it, and that is that that puts the power in the hands of the people, the juries. And that's painful to bureaucrats. Okay, they can't stand that. So the statutory law is the law of the special interests. The common law is the law of the people. The statutory law is written. It has an authoritative source and written down. The common law is, well, it's whatever we say it is. Okay? Boy, does that make a difference. And because custom and usage is very stable, you'll see fads come and go, but how long does a fad last? It's gone. There's a certain stability to our style, our culture, any culture. You go, to, you go to any country, you'll see they have their way of doing things. Their customary phrases, their customary uh, acts or whatever. So common law is an excellent means for stabilizing society. You want to destabilize society? Throw out the common law and go 100% statute. You'll, you'll see how fast a dictatorship shows up. Because if they can write anything into the statutes without regard to the people, well, you know somebody's going to come along that's rich enough to bribe somebody. I think they call it lobbying, right? So that's one of the, one of the problems with the statutory system. So uh, anyway, like I said, there's two great areas of law. One of them is the common law, and then there's everything else. Because everything else must be written. Everything else, you see, the, the Constitution of the United States says, here's what you can do, here's what you can't do. The state constitutions say the same thing. Here's what you can do, here's what you can't do. When you, meaning the, the, the state itself, okay, that organization of people that call themselves the state. It, it, the constitutions, the whole idea of a constitution is to put a fence around these guys and contain them. The constitution was not written for you wasn't written for me. It was written for them. It says right in there, if you look at the preamble, the preamble says, we the people of the United States, or we the people of the United States, right, uh, in order to accomplish this laundry list of tasks, uh, I'm kind of extemporizing there, do hereby ordain and establish this constitution for the United States of America. See, we the people of the United States, United States is two words, and we ordain and establish this constitution for the United States of America. That's four words, United States of America. So the United States is different from the United States of America. The United States is all these states that are united. The United States of America is the corporate organization that's located in this plot of land called the District of Columbia. Okay? That corporation is a public trust. It's not even a country. You've got to get real technical. The United States of America is not a country. The states are countries. Every state in the Union is a country. How can you tell the difference between a state and a corporation? It's real easy. All corporations have a president, secretary, and treasurer. Does the United States of America have a president, secretary, and treasurer? Yeah. Okay? And they're appointed, aren't they? Excepting for the president. He's elected. 
but the rest are appointed, okay, with the approval of Congress. So uh, the United States of America is a corporation, and all corporations are trusts. Okay, they don't use that word. Normally when you hear the word trust, you're thinking of maybe a Massachusetts trust or a common law trust or maybe some other, you know, what do they call it, uh, uh, was it UBO, unincorporated business organization, something like that. There's various trusts, okay? But, the, but a corporation is also a trust. And in fact, if you look at the preamble, just the preamble of the United States, Every word in there is what you would expect of a trust. It has a trustee, it has a trustor, and it has a beneficiary, and it has a description of the authority of the trustee. Okay? We the people, we're the trusters, uh, in order to accomplish this list of jobs, okay, that's the, uh, that's the, the job description, do or ordain and establish this constitution that's the Articles of Incorporation, okay, for the trustee, the United States of America. So you have a trust organization there, a corporation. So the corporation is told what it can do, but I believe it's the Ninth Amendment that says that just because we listed the Bill of Rights, that doesn't mean everything's listed here, okay? Basically, it says that it's reserved, what we haven't granted to them is reserved to the states or to the people. Okay? You're all familiar with that, I think. Probably read that in the Constitution. Well, that's an important, very important phrase because what that says is if your job is not described here, you can't assume it. Now, I understand that they assume a lot of jobs and that's a problem because they're busy trying to ignore the Constitution whenever they can. But the fact of the matter is, is that they're not authorized, okay? The United States of America has no sovereignty. State of California, as well as California, have no sovereignty, okay? The sovereignty is in the people. And it says that in the government code. You read the government code, it specifically says in California government code that the sovereignty is in the people. And it also says in the government code, section 11120 and section 54950, I believe, it says right there, and I'll quote it word for word, it says, the people of this state do not yield their sovereignty to the agencies which serve them. That's a word for word quote. I got that one memorized. I use it a lot in court. Okay? That judge is my agent. And until I grant him the authority to push me around, he has no authority. Now, that's theory. I know in actual practice we've got a problem there, okay? But the fact of the matter is, is that when you go to court, you've got to remember one thing. When you put a lawsuit in court, a lot of people talk tough, okay, including me. But when we get to court, you better throw that toughness out, and here's why. When you go to court, you bring your, law, your, your case in there, you don't have any guns to back it up. You have no power, no physical power. You may have legal power, but you don't have physical power. You can go all the way through and get a judgment in your favor, but the next question is how do you enforce it, okay? The only way you're going to enforce any judgment is if you have the cooperation of the very people that you're trying to get under control. So I suggest to people that keep in mind that it doesn't matter what your judgment is if you don't have internal support for your judgment. Not internal support, meaning somebody on the inside who's in a position of power that can take command on the inside and make sure that your paperwork works. Okay? How do you do that? Well, there's no formula. But I can tell you this. You better be a nice person. Okay? Nobody's going to support you if they don't like you. Okay? So you want them to like you. And there's lessons to learn. I mean, this is, this, is, this is proven in history. There was a, uh, uh, a period of time in, I believe it was Thailand. In Thailand, uh, they had a dictatorship there. And the system had a pretty 
simple definition. If you were dissident, you disappeared at midnight. That's all. No problem. Okay? Of course, a lot of dissidents didn't know that, and there weren't enough cops to go around, so it took them a while to kill all the dissidents, and then every time they killed a dissident, they created two more. So it did, didn't really, that system didn't really work, but governments tend to be short-sighted that way. So, uh, but that was what they would do. They just simply, the person would disappear at midnight. Nobody would ever see him again. Okay? So, there was one group of people, however, that was really, really messing up the government. I mean, they, the, the Thailand government was just having a heck of a time with this group of people. They were called Buddhists. And what these Buddhists would do is they'd go out in the middle of the intersection, douse themselves in kerosene, and set themselves on fire. Of course, that killed them. And uh, this created all kinds of international embarrassment. This is back in, I guess, in the 70s, something like that, 1970s. But they, they, uh, uh, they, it just created embarrassment. There was international furor over this. You know, what are you doing to these people? Why are you, you know? So it was a tremendous embarrassment to the government. And the source of all that was the top man, the head of the Buddhists. You know, he, I guess, somehow issued the order, okay, it's time for somebody to go out and burn himself again. All right? And uh, here he went, the Buddhist, the chief Buddhist, whatever they call him, the head Buddhist, he traveled about the country with minimum security. And nothing ever happened to him. He did more damage to the government than any dissident ever did and yet nothing happened to him. Why not? Well, nobody knows why not, but there's some theories, okay? One of the speculations is that this man, because he was the head of the Buddhists, he was a very large organization. And because it was a large organization, he was in with the power structure. He went to the parties, he met, the, everybody knew him personally, okay? He wasn't just some remote figure like some dissident might be. The people in government knew him personally. And universally, he was loved. Not just liked. They loved him. His enemies loved him. Nobody wanted to kill him. <laughs> okay? And he survived. He never did get attacked. Why? Well, the theory is, is that he was just simply too likable. They, they, I mean, sure, we had our battle going on, but it was nothing personal, you know? A lot of people make this personal. They go in scowling at the clerks, scowling at the sheriffs, scowling at the judge. You know, that's not how you conduct a lawsuit. You go in there, you be friendly to anybody. Uh, some of you have heard me tell this joke before, but I'll tell it again. I go in a clerk, I have a standing joke. I always, every time I meet a clerk, it's always a new face, okay? I make friends with them, I'm, I'm friendly. Hi, how are you? Uh, got, I got a tough problem today, can you help out, or whatever, you know, but I'm friendly. There's no contention. I keep the contention out of my voice, try to keep it friendly. But I do have a joke that I tell them. I say, did you hear about that big parking ticket hassle that went on in the court upstairs the other day? They say, no, what happened? I say, well, this guy was making a federal case out of his parking ticket, and he was just talking and talking and talking and finally the judge got ran out of patience and he said to the man he says sir didn't you see the sign and the man answered back to him yeah your honor I saw the sign it said fine for parking <laughs> that little joke never fails with those people okay they love it so you tell that you know it takes the, the tension out it, it kind of it gets friendly and you are friendly. You should be friendly. Because you never know when one of those people is going to help you. You never know. One of the most important rules that we ever found was because a clerk helped us. This woman went into, uh, uh, this happened in Kansas, in a federal court. And she had taken the time to develop good relations with these people. And after this case had been going on a year or two, and, uh, but one day, she got to the point where she was trying to file an order, okay? Mm -hmm. Clerk wouldn't file it. So then she generated an order ordering the clerk to file it. And the clerk said, you can't do that. 
and they argued. It was like Friday, on a Friday of the week. And they argued for four hours over this. And by the way, it was a friendly argument, okay? So there was nothing personal, but there was a difference in, in opinions about this, and they were trying to work it out. And this woman made sure that she never allowed it to get to be a personal kind of thing, okay? It's just business, but, you know, and they were quoting laws and going back and forth. Well, after four hours, the, the clerk was adamant, no. If you want to, if, if you believe that I must file this order in order to get me to do it, you have to take your case up to the appellate court and get an appellate court order ordering me to then file it. That's what the clerk told her. So about midday, she gave up. She went home, okay? And then she called me on the phone, and we, we talked about it. Anyhow, <clears throat> Saturday afternoon, I got another phone call from the, from the plaintiff. She... She told me she got a letter from the clerk. Apparently, the clerk had mailed it that Friday. And the letter said, and it arrived the very next day, Saturday. The letter said, the letter invited her down to come down and file that order. Okay? What had happened was that after she left at midday, the clerk spent the afternoon researching it. And she didn't have to do that. I mean, the clerk honestly felt that there was no authority there, and yet enough points were raised. She researched it, and she found the specific law, actually code, in Title uh, 28, United States Code, Section 1361, 1361. And that specific code says that whenever there is a duty uh, to be performed by the clerk, the trial court had original jurisdiction, not the appellate court, but the trial court had the original jurisdiction to issue an order to, the, uh, to any government person, which would be the clerk, to perform a duty that was owed to the plaintiff. Catch that? The plaintiff, not the defendant. And she was the plaintiff. Now, you know, most of your laws are written down the middle. This one's clearly biased. This one's written for the plaintiff. What happened to the defendant? Well, see, what it turned out to be is that usually it's the defendant that's having an argument. And the defendant is the one who has to go to the appellate court. The plaintiff doesn't have to go to the appellate court. He can go to the, the trial court level and get the very same kind of order. Why is there a difference? Well, the, re the, the difference is this. It all goes back to what is a court. A court is specifically defined as the person and the suit of the sovereign. So the plaintiff was the person, and the lawsuit that you filed, that, that was the suit. Put them together, that's the legal definition of a court. So in other words, think of it of a different way. The king is sitting, or the queen is sitting on the throne, and that's the court in front of him, okay? And the suit means the suitors or the, the courtiers, all those people in the courtroom, they constitute the suite of people. Later, we dropped the E and called it a suit instead of a suite. But that's the background of what a court is. So the king always has authority to issue his own order in his own court. So the plaintiff can issue the order from the district court to the clerk, whereas the defendant is an outsider to the court. He's being brought into the court, and he has no authority over the plaintiff. What he has to do is he has to take it up to the appellate court and get the appellate court to bring down an order from above to make them do what they're supposed to do. Okay? That's why, that's why Section 1361 only talks about the plaintiff and not about the defendant. It's recognizing what a court is. So, because of the good relations that were maintained, it really paid off. We used a lot, of, and I didn't know that rule existed until the clerk found it for us. So, always keep good relationships with the court personnel whenever possible. I mean, you know some of those court personnel, first chance they get, they'll stab you in the back, okay? Don't let that affect your demeanor. You continue to be nice to them. If you can stab them in the back sometime, 
legally, well, that's a different story, okay? But person to person, on an individual level, hi, how are you? You meet the opposing attorney, hi, how you doing? How's your kids? You got kids? You know, whatever. You just be nice. Tell them a joke. Sometimes you can tell them a good lawyer joke, you know. You'd expect it from you, you know. But, uh, you know, how can you tell a, a, uh, an attorney is lying? You know that one. His lips are moving, right? What's the other way to tell him he's, he's lying? Or to tell if he's lying? His lips are not moving. Okay? The first one is the sin of commission. The other is the sin of omission. Okay? So, you can tell these little jokes to them. And be sort of friendly. It's not a phony friendliness. You really want to be friendly. You really want to have the right attitude in you, okay? And, but if you have the right attitude, it's going to reflect in them. You try it sometime. You just meet somebody and you start off with a smile. Somebody else, you try it, start off with a frown. You'll see it'll be reflected back to you, okay? So you start off with these people and always be the best, nicest person that they have ever met. That doesn't mean you're not a tough fighter when you're on the floor, okay? Or when you're writing your papers, you're still a tough fighter. But try to keep good relations. Uh, show you how this can work. A friend of mine, uh, friend of mine was suing Security First National Bank. Now they since merged in with Bank of America. And the opposing attorney was just giving him a hard time. You know, he wanted to find out the name of a specific person. He knew who the person was, where they worked and all this, but he just didn't have the name and he wanted to get the name. And so he was trying to do discovery and this attorney just wasn't cooperating. And since he couldn't find out who it was, he had to take it up to that person's supervisor. The only problem is he couldn't find out who the person's supervisor was. So he took it all the way up to the chairman of the board. He says, I know his name. He couldn't find the name of anybody else, but he knew who the chairman's name was. So he named the chairman as the uh, person to respond to the discovery. And then he and his brother went downtown. They went into the building. It was one of these high-rise buildings, okay, with like 20, 30 stories. Went all the way up to the top floor, and he got by security. They let him in. Of course, he was well-dressed. You know, he looked like he was executive himself. And so did his brother, who was doing the actual service. And they got to the secretary and informed the secretary they had some legal papers to serve to the chairman. And, and he also apologized. He was nice. He says, look, you know, he says, uh, I had no choice. I have to follow this legal procedure, and I need to personally serve him. So she said, okay, whatever, you know, let them in. So he gets in. He meets the chairman of Security Pacific National Bank. And the guy was really a nice guy. And, uh, and by the way, they're all nice guys, okay? No matter what they do on the outside, they're all nice guys. And so, uh, he, he, again, he was nice to the chairman. He, he apologized for bothering. He says, you know, he says, this is just a small lawsuit, but he says, uh, I had no choice, and so I'm here, and I'm sorry to bother you and take your time, but I, it, it was the only legal thing I could do. The chairman said, that's okay. What, what's it all about? You know, he accepted service, and he said, What's it all about? And so I gave him a little thumbnail sketch of what it was about. And, uh, and so they were discussing it. And then finally he said to the chairman, he says, well, he says, uh, I got to get from downtown all the way out to Santa Monica, so I have to leave now. Traffic's building up. And I, because I have to serve the attorney with this paper today also. So the chairman said, well, come this way, okay? So they went through some door. They went up the stairs. They ended up on the roof. And there was a helicopter there. They got in the helicopter. He gave him a ride over to Santa Monica. When they got to Santa Monica, there was a limousine waiting, two limousines waiting for him, one for the chairman and one for them. They got into one for them. <laughs> the limousine took him to the attorney's office. The attorney was standing in the doorway waiting for them to show up. <laughs> I think somebody spoke to him. And they served the attorney. The attorney was absolutely livid but restrained. <laughs> okay, he accepted the service. The limousine took him back. Helicopter flew him back to the top of that building. They validated his parking, and he went home. <laughs> Unbelievable, right? Talk about service. <laughs> now, there's service. Anyhow, it all goes back to the same principle. Be nice to your enemy, 
okay? Don't let, I know that, you know, the pain that we go through sometimes, psychological as well as physical, can be tremendous. You know, your whole lifestyle may be at stake. But you have to segregate yourself. You have to develop a little schizophrenia here. You gotta segregate yourself, you know, pretend you're your own attorney in some ways, that pretend it's not your case, you're handling it for someone else. Because you gotta keep a good attitude. And it, it'll really help a lot in, in various instances. And this is how it helped these people, you know? So those are some war stories that were kind of fun. Well, anyhow, <clears throat> so in this other system of law, we have the common law and we have the other system of law. This other system of law absolutely has to be in writing, all of it, okay? Now, so we have these different written law systems. You have, for example, the Roman civil law system, uh, also known as statutes. You have the uh, uh, you have maritime law, you have admiralty law, you've got the law merchant. Well, law merchant is kind of loose. That's, but anyway, they've been tightening that up so that the law merchant has now been coded into the uh, UCC, Uniform Commercial Code. That's really the modern law merchant. But <clears throat> there's, I had a big argument one time, friendly argument by the way, very friendly, but I put on a seminar and it was a two-day seminar and toward the end of the first day, I got a real strong challenge. There was one of the, one of the people in this group, it was in uh, Colorado where this took place, and one of the people was really, really totally versed in admiralty law. He knew pretty much all that needed to know about admiralty law. He studied it, lived and breathed it. And so he kept telling me that, well, you can have the common law in admiralty law, okay? And he kept telling me that, that uh, the common law, you know, doing this. And so <clears throat> he was pretty good at countering my uh, suggestions and so forth, and I wasn't really prepared for that, so naturally he won, okay? So we all went home that day, and I have to give the point to him. He talked a good case, and he, uh, uh, you know, there's an old saying that, uh, Speech is the death of, of thought. So I was doing an awful lot of talking at the end of that day, but I wasn't doing much thinking. But after it was all over and we went home for the evening, I had some chance to think about it. When the morning came, I was ready for him. And so we all got together in the morning and I said, look, I said, uh, we're gonna suspend the normal seminar here. We have to tackle this point because you won yesterday and I can't let you get away with that. And we were friendly, okay, it was a very, very warm uh, interaction that we had, so. And I said, and here's what I'm gonna do today. I said, I'm gonna hang you on your own words, okay? And so I got him to agree to things. I said, now, here's, here's the sovereignty, the people, we're sovereigns, right? He says, right. And I said, now here's the Constitution. We created it, didn't we, right? He says, right. Okay, then we have the Congress. And the Congress is controlled by the, the Constitution, right? Right. So then I said, all right, now the Congress passes all these rules, and one set of rules that they created was called admiralty. So no matter how you slice it, the admiralty draws its authority from the Congress, which in turn draws its authority from the Constitution, which in turn draws its authority from the people, okay? Now the problem is, is that I'm one of the people, and I have no direct control over the the Admiralty. They have the control that I've delegated to them and they produce these written rules. Now, I, he, I said, now you have in your Admiralty a provision that you can bring the common law in, right? He says, right. Okay, so here you are with that structure, people, Constitution, Congress, Admiralty law, and then common law under that. And I said, now you have all the benefits of common law, don't you? He says, right, you do. I said, you've got all except one. And that is, you have no direct authority over it. Now let's look at the other branch. The people, go back to the people. The people stay outside the Constitution and create their own court. If you're in your sovereign capacity, you're gonna do what kings do. 
You create your own court. You make your own law. In fact, there is a rule that says, a, a court case that says that the very essence of sovereignty is that the sovereign creates the law or decrees the law. Okay? So you decree the law of your sovereign. So here you are, sovereign, then you create your own court, you decree your own law, and one of the things that I will decree in my sovereign capacity is that we're going to use the common law. So you have the common law down this branch of thought or philosophy, and you have the common law down this branch of it, okay? Now what happens if you do something over here under the Constitution, under the, the Congress, under the Admiralty Law, you do something in common law that's in conflict with it? Well, if the common law is in conflict, you're going to invoke something similar to Section 22.2 of the uh, California Civil Code, I believe it is, which says, and also I think there's a penal code, maybe it's 22.2 of the penal code, which says that the common law shall be the rule of decision so long as it's not repugnant to the statutes. Okay? In other words, the statutes are higher than the common law. Well, if you go down that line of thought, that's what you're going to have. But if you go down the other line of thought where the people create the court, decree the law, and they say that the common law is a law, and as long as you're sovereign, you can say the common law, uh, you can say that the statutory law shall be the rule of decision so long as it's not repugnant to the common law. You can reverse the positions over here by your own personal authority as a sovereign. So I just said, well, which would you rather have? Would you rather have a common law that's subjugated to the admiralty law, or would you like to have common law that supersedes it? It all depends on which line of authority you follow. Well, he was so into the admiralty law that he had a hard time shifting gears, which is understandable. You get a mode of thought. It's difficult to shift. But guess what? I had at least half the group there trying to explain to him why he was wrong. <laughs> <laughs> that they, they clearly saw that although they could have the common law under the admiralty, why would they want to give up their power? Right? I mean, that's basically what a boiled town is. Here they had all the power over here that was delegated, and the Congress could change it any time they choose to. Or the judge could change it on the spot because there's flexibility granted to the judge. So that's why I picked the common law, and I picked sovereignty, and I stay out of the Constitution. See, the Constitution, the people are above the Constitution. The people created the Constitution as a set of instructions. You've got to remember this, that the Constitution does not grant any rights whatsoever to you. You read it, and you'll see that the Constitution recognizes the rights. It even says so in the uh, Ninth Amendment, I believe it is, that says something to the effect that just because we made a list here, that doesn't mean that's all there is. Of course, I don't have the wording just right, but that's what it says. So that Constitution is, um, is, very, is very important, but it's only for those guys over there. And since we're outside the Constitution, we're above it, since we have sovereignty, we can create our own courts. And I do it all the time. We do it right in the, in the building. I run my court in their buildings. I don't, I don't do like you've, you, you've probably heard the one Supreme Court. You've heard of that in the past. There, there have been people, for a while, that was a hot topic. And uh, so the one Supreme Court, they would, people would actually set up their own courts, their own juries, and they were not meeting in the government court buildings. My court is in the government court building. I use their clerks. I let their judge sit on my bench. You know, it, has, it appears to be a card, and I, I even let them scam a little. You know, I, I pretend, I allow the judge to pretend that he's in charge when he even knows he isn't. Because after all, I'm not trying to upset his game or his relationship with all the other attorneys. You know? But you should see it. We, we, the, court, the judge will be sitting there, and he'll turn to the plaintiff, and he'll say that, uh, I think we should do so-and-so. And then he looks at the plaintiff, and the plaintiff will say, yeah, that sounds good. And then he'll turn to the attorney and say, well, what do you think? And, and the attorney always says, yeah, that's fine, judge. But you see, the judge thinks that the, I mean, the attorney thinks that the judge made the decision or had the authority, when in reality, the judge got the approval first from the 
the plaintiff who owned the court. See, the judge is the highest officer of the court. He is not the court. The owner of the court is the, is the creator of the court. That is the plaintiff. Courts can't, the, the government courts can't do anything until somebody gives them the authority to do so. How do they get the authority? By filing a case. But it, doesn't, it, it isn't that simple. In your case, you say what kind of forum you're in. What I do is I say it's a court of record. And by the way, here's the court of record right down here. Okay? So a court of record is very important. That, that, in fact, we'll just show it to you. Court of record. Here's the five requirements of a court of record. It keeps a record of the proceedings. It, it generally has a seal, number five. Uh, number four has the power to fine or imprison for temp, uh, contempt. By the way, number one and number four, that's what you see in Black's Law Dictionary, fifth edition. Okay? Black's Law Dictionary, fifth edition, that's all it says. But the other three requirements are there too. I just read to you number five. And then there's number three, proceeding according to the common law. Now that's very important. You know why that's important? Because the Constitution of California, the 1879 one, you know, the one that's not even official, but everybody's using it. The 1879 Constitution, which the judge wants us to believe is what we're operating by, says right in it that all the courts in California are courts of record. So what's a court of record? Well, a court of record is proceeding according to the common law. No statutes. Okay? All those codes don't apply. You ever heard of the penal code? Everybody's heard of the penal code, right? No stat, doesn't apply. Penal code doesn't apply. Okay? Because, not in the court of record, because that's statutory law. That's code, that's not common law. So, they have no jurisdiction. And of course, that's why they have arraignment. Because, since they have no jurisdiction, they have to get you to grant the jurisdiction. How do they do that? They say, well, you're accused of violating such and such a code. Is the code valid, but you're not guilty? Or is the code valid and you are guilty? Or is the code valid and it's no contest? In all three cases, the code's valid, right? So if you agree to the code, then they, they got you in contract and they proceed against you. All you have to do is enter one of those three pleas and you've, you've agreed that the, that code is valid. And that's how they get you into the alternative courts. So the real court is the court of record. The alternative court is these, you know, the, these courts you see how they operate. Anytime you see it, uh, see it going according to statute, you know it's not a common law court. It's not a court of record as required by the Constitution. But see, you have an unlimited right to contract, so you can contract out of it. And they take advantage of your ignorance, of course. The second requirement is the killer, though. <clears throat> the tribunal is independent of the magistrate. In a court of record, the tribunal is the one who does the judging. The magistrate is the public official on the government payroll who's granted some authority by the state to do certain things. But of course, he cannot violate the basic premise of a court of record because the tribunal is the one that does the judging. That has to be independent of the magistrate. And since a magistrate is basically anybody on the government payroll who's been granted state authority, he doesn't qualify to make any decisions. He can't be a tribunal. So what do I do? I pick the constitutional forum, court of record. Okay? So that's a really important concept. And so we go to a court of record and we run our case that way, common law. That throws out admiralty law. That throws out... Uh, in fact, it throws out the whole statutory system. It throws out everything in the Constitution. Okay? Because you're the sovereign, you decree what the law is, and if they don't like it, they can always get a jury who will sit in judgment of your law. Right? That gives you that uh, custom and usage that we talk about, that the common, common law is custom and usage. Okay? We have a lot of cases where uh, we've done that. We've gone into court, judge makes a decision. Hey, judge, you're not a tribunal. You can't be issuing orders. So we wish, issue an order vacating the judge's order. It's real easy. Well, actually, it's not that easy. 
mean, it takes time to sit down and write the papers, of course. But uh, it's all cut and dried, okay? As a matter of fact, on the disk that I gave you, you'll look there, you'll see, let's see if I can smallify this a little. There we go. You'll see that, <clears throat> oh, I guess I have to go back one more. Here's the, the uh, this is what you see when you first put this disk into your computer. There we go. This is what you see when you first put that disk into your computer. It should come up automatically. And uh, <clears throat> you have an example on there, okay? And all you have to do is click on example, and it brings up this case log. And right up here near the top, you see where it says ruling. And you click on the ruling, and then that takes you down to this part of the page, and you have it written in red here. And you click on the ruling there, and that takes you to the actual ruling that was given to a judge where he was found in contempt of court. This is the one where we find him a dollar. You can see everything that's there. Basically, we have, uh, this is the important part right here. We've got four sections to this thing. We have the judicial cognizance. The judicial cognizance, that's kind of like, you've all heard of, uh, I got a mental block here. What do they call it? Judicial what? Notice. Okay? You've all heard of judicial notice. Well, judicial notice means that this is something that the court has to take notice of when considering something. Okay, when the, the court takes judicial notice of something, it says, well, okay, this is one of the factors that we have to consider in this case. You can take judicial notice of the laws of the United States, the laws of California, or whatever state you're in. You can take judicial notice that the sun rises and sets every morning and evening. Okay, you can take judicial notice of things that are unquestioned. They don't have to be proven in evidence. It's just too obvious, right? So. That's, that's what judicial notice is. And so the, the court in the case can take, see whether that thing is taking judicial notice of, does it have any relevancy to this case, okay? Judicial cognizance is a notch above that. Judicial cognizance means that the, the court absolutely cannot violate that. That does apply to this case. Or as we say right here at the bottom, judicial cognizance is judicial notice or knowledge upon which a judge is bound to act without having it proved in evidence. He's bound to it. It isn't just taken into consideration and see whether or not it applies. It does apply and it must conform. Okay, that's judicial cognizance. So we put down, this is the law of the case. Remember I said you decree the law? Well, this is how we did it. In this particular ruling, we said that we took judicial cognizance. We said this court takes judicial cognizance and decrees as follows. That is the decreeing of the law by the sovereign. So you got all these things that apply, and there are various things in here that were reasonably relevant to this uh, case. But here's this one at the top. The very meaning of sovereignty is that the decree of the sovereign makes law. That was a decision that came out of American Banana Company versus United Fruit Company. And uh, <clears throat> so, are you sovereign? Well, we do have the California Code, which says that, uh, if I can find it here, yeah, right here at the top. It is the public policy of this state that public agencies exist to aid in the conduct of the people's business. The people of this state do not yield their sovereignty to the agencies which serve them. That's in the California Government Code. California Government Code is not written for you or me. It's written for the government employees to tell them what the score is. So you don't yield your sovereignty. And if you're sovereign, what is a sovereign? Well, basically, a sovereign is somebody who has no accountability. If there's any accountability that you have as a sovereign, is that you're accountable if you injure someone else. You're accountable if you invade the sovereignty of someone else. Yeah, now you're accountable. And who's going to get you? Well, 13 other people. One of them is the one you hurt, and the other 12 is the jury. <clears throat> okay? That's, that's a beautiful system, actually, when, when it's working right. Okay, well anyhow, so we have a section here where we decree the law. 
And then we go down further into the next section. If I can get down there somewhere. There it is. Oh, we have all the impeachment. I guess I went by it. We'll just go up to the top. Okay. So here's your, your four sections. You have the judicial cognizance. We saw that. You have findings of fact. That's where we took in all the facts, considered, and, here's, and, and then we discuss it, come to some conclusion of law, and then we impeach them and apply the penalty. Okay? So that's the actual thing. If you want to read it later on that CD, you can. But that's, that's in the example. How do you file a lawsuit? Well, here's a brief example of a lawsuit. <clears throat> Look at the first amended action right here. Okay. I guess I really should make that larger, shouldn't I? So you can see it better. There. How's that? I'll see if I can find the beginning of it. Here we are, the first amended action, okay? <clears throat> you, know, you file an action, but if you want to correct it, you can amend it. And there's a pro procedure to go for amending it. But then when you file the amended action, that then replaces the prior one. Okay? So in the first amended action, basically, this is it here. And this first amended action, paragraph one, normally would not be in your lawsuit. But this first, we put it here because, after all, we had a prior lawsuit, so we have to explain what we're doing. So we're saying the first amended action amends by entire substitution the action filed before in the above entitled court. And then, but paragraph two normally would be paragraph one. And in paragraph two, we say, William Jones, here and after plaintiff, is one of the people of California and in this court of record complains of, blah, blah, blah. Well. Here's what happened. That simple little sentence is probably the most powerful thing that you'll ever write in your papers. Okay? When you identify yourself as one of the people of the jurisdiction, in this case the jurisdiction is California, William Jones is one of the people of California. The people created California. Okay? They are the sovereigns. So just by saying you're one of the people, you have automatically said you're a sovereign. You're in your sovereign capacity. You've automatically put the judge below you. You're automatically in charge. You own the outfit. If you don't own the outfit, the load is on them to prove you're not. Okay? So you own the outfit. You're one of the people. And the people don't yield their sovereignty to the agencies which serve them. Okay? I rub that into them. And the next thing is, is, and in this court of record, complains of. Okay? What's a court of record? A court of record is common law. A court of record, the tribunal is independent of the magistrate. In other words, that judge can't say boo. If he does, he's out of line. Okay? So that's why I say you don't have to say you're a sovereign. You don't have to say you have Yahweh on your side. Okay? Or God's on your side. You don't have to say any of that. You can't say you're one of the children of Jesus and you're entitled to certain God-given rights. You don't have to say any of that. It's all said right there in that simple little sentence. And you know what's beautiful about this? Is that they all read right over it. <clears throat> they don't catch the significance of this. They just read right over it. So, okay, you're one of the people and you're in the court of record. Well, sure. Now, if you got an attorney who was alert enough that he would say, hmm, court of record, what's that? He goes, no, you know, an attorney, that's his business. So he's going to have the latest, greatest reference materials, right? So he goes to his Black's Law Dictionary, 8th edition, I suppose, or 7th edition. He breaks it open, looks at court of record, and says, oh, right here, a court of record has the power to fine or imprison for contempt, and it keeps a record of the proceedings. Well, okay, well, that makes sense, you know, close the book, right? Little does he know, you just took charge of the court. <laughs> now look, all attorneys, you look at their business cards, and they say right on there, his name, attorney at law. What's an attorney at law? 
An attorney at law is somebody who's trained in the common law. Well, first of all, I have yet to meet an attorney that's trained in the common law. I have yet to meet one that even knows what it is. Okay? You ask him, he'll tell you, oh, common law. Well, that's case law. Well, no, it isn't, but nice try. That's what they teach him in school. Case law is like 1% of it. Okay? You know, I don't know how valid case law is because, after all, at its very best, it's hearsay evidence, right? I'm not sure how valid, how, how that can be brought into a case, not as evidence, maybe as law, but not as evidence. But in any case, you see, um, you slide right over that and you're the plaintiff. Now, if you're a defendant in a case, you have to convert yourself into a plaintiff. So what you do is you do a counterclaim and you become the they are the plaintiff, you're the defendant. In your counterclaim, you're the counter plaintiff and they are the counter defendant. And the issue that you bring up is jurisdiction. That's the number one issue, jurisdiction. Because when you challenge jurisdiction, what they're supposed to do is they're supposed to stop everything and prove the jurisdiction to your court. They have to prove it, not just claim it, not assume it, but bring in the evidence to prove they have proper jurisdiction. They don't know how to do that, and they never do. Okay? It's, it's a big problem we have with these people. But anyhow, that's just a little brief taste. So, <clears throat> now, I told you I was going to talk about a republic versus democracy. That was the advertised thing. I haven't even touched on that yet. But I had to give you kind of some background. Okay? So let's go back to... Um, the law notes, okay, and um, the foundation. Let's talk about a republic versus democracy. Okay, you all know the Pledge of Allegiance. <clears throat> a Pledge of Allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands. We don't pledge allegiance to the democracy. We pledge allegiance to the republic. Well, that's fine, but what is the difference between a, a democracy and a republic? Why did the founding fathers pick the republican form of government instead of the democratic form of government? Well, it's very simple. In a pure democracy, 51 beats 49. That's all. Hey, we have this big argument. What are we going to do? We're a group, okay? And we want to know what to do. So we argue back and forth, we say what we're going to say, and when we're all through, we're going to have a big vote on it. And we vote. If 51% say it's going to be a certain way, the other 49 have to yield. Okay? Well, let's tra translate that into plain English. That, what we just said was that 49% have no rights. Whatever the majority wants, that's what the majority gets. No rights. Last thing you want is democracy. You hear all these people running around, we want democracy, blah, blah, blah. Yeah, right. You have democracy, and you'll see some real loss of rights. Because whatever the majority wants, they put together an initiative, they vote on it, they put it in, you're subject to it. No exceptions. Now, what's the definition of a citizen? Well, I just told you, it's you're born or naturalized in the United States, and you're subject to the jurisdiction. Subject means you're controlled. Okay? You can't buck it. If one of you walks up to me, well, let's say I walk up to you and I say, hey, uh, you got pink shoes. And your first response will probably be, well, so what's it to you? Right? You know, who am I to lord over my personal preferences over you? Okay? If we're equal and you're not doing me any harm, oh, well, I'm going to claim you're, you're hurting my eyes with the pink shoes. But if you're not doing any actual harm, then uh, uh, I have no jurisdiction over you, okay? So, but in a democracy, if you're subject to the jurisdiction, you have to do whatever you're told. And what's our method for telling you what to do? Well, we call them statutes, okay? So in a democracy, the statutes are everything. In a, in a democracy, you're instructed what to do, what you can do, what you can't do, and so forth. And we have a name for that. Okay? Now remember, any time that you're granted a privilege or your privilege is taken away, that's all done by statute. 
So you have certain privileges, you have certain immunities, which are granted to you. Catch the word, granted. Okay? Granted by whom? Granted by the government. Okay? If you're subject to the jurisdiction, then you have to play the game according to the rules of the jurisdiction. So, in a democracy, you absolutely have no choice but to go along with the commands of the majority. Now, it's very important to bureaucrats to keep charge, to have control. So, but it's also important that when they're controlling you that you don't understand you're being controlled. So they got to get you to somehow be in the jurisdiction, but they sure don't want you to know that they don't have any jurisdiction, right? <laughs> they got to trick you into it somehow. Well, the easiest way is to take advantage of your ignorance. All right? So how do they do that? Well, you go to school, and what is the first thing they teach you? Right? Probably second grade, maybe first grade. They teach you the Pledge of Allegiance. They teach you uh, that you're a citizen, you've got to be a good citizen, you have certain duties and so forth, right? And then they teach you what the benefits of citizenship are, you know, whatever they may be. They teach you a bunch of stuff. And as you progress through high school, you learn all these things. Well, if they were to tell you that these were privileges that were granted to you, and of course, since they're privileges, they could be taken away from you whenever convenient to the government. If they were to tell you that, I suspect if everybody really understood that, we'd have a revolution within 24 hours. So they don't tell you that, because governments have an allergy to uh, revolutions. They don't want that kind of thing. So how do they get around it? Well, what they do is they, they give these privileges a name, a special name. And you've heard it thousands of times, I'm sure, listening to the radio, TV, and everything, and reading the papers. Two words, civil rights. That's what these privileges are called. They should be called civil privileges. They're civil rights. Believe me, you don't want civil rights. That's the last thing you want. Well, you might use it if it works to your advantage, but I'm telling you, you don't want civil rights. What you want is natural rights. You want the ones you're born with, not the ones that are gifted to you, okay? <clears throat> you don't, they teach you to say you're a citizen of the United States. Well, what happens if you're not a citizen of the United States? Well, then you must be one of the people of the United States because you were born here, you belong here, okay? Well, if you're not a citizen, you've got to be a people. See, the people own the government, and the government owns the citizens. That's the pecking order. People are defined in the preamble. Citizens are defined in the 14th Amendment. Okay? You go back, you read that, that, uh, that preamble. The preamble says, we the people ordain and establish this constitution for you guys over there. Well, isn't that the boss speaking? And you're not giving up anything. You created this outfit, but you're not giving up anything when you did so. You ordain it, you establish it. Nothing says that they can now take you over. So as long as you're one of the people. Now, what does it take to be one of the people? Education. That's what it takes. So all, the only thing that stands between you and being one of the people is education, the knowledge. A lot of that knowledge is on the CD, okay? You, you can take advantage of it. That's a free CD. You don't owe me anything for it, okay? I hope you make good use of it. Now, I told you all about a democracy. I suspect that uh, if you really see what I told you, you don't want any part of a democracy, okay? Because a democracy just means you've got this... Group. Now, here's the legal definition of a democracy, right here. Democracy. <clears throat> well, I've got to make it big again, right? Let's, let's make it big. There we go. Now we're back up where we can read it. Okay. Democracy. That form of government in which the sovereign power resides in and is exercised by the whole body of free citizens, directly or indirectly, through a system of representation as distinguished from a monarchy, aristocracy, or oligarchy. All right, let's tear that apart a little bit. The sovereignty does not have, gov does not have sovereignty. I mean, the government does not have sovereignty. All the sovereignty is in the people. But which people? It's the whole body of people. 
Individually, there's no sovereignty in a democracy. In a, in a democracy, people get together as a group. They vote on something, just like they're doing in Iraq. Okay? They vote on it. If, every, if a majority agrees, then that becomes the rules. Okay? But the, it, the, the people as a group are taking the vote, and as a group, they're directing what will be. So that's your democracy. And then the whole body of citizens could decide that they're not going to trust government. The whole body of citizens could probably pass an initiative if they chose to, saying, well, the government's not going to handle this problem. We'll handle it ourselves. We're taking the... We could, we could pass an initiative, for example, taking away the uh, road repair, taking that away from the government and saying every citizen is responsible for the potholes in, his hand, in, in front of his house. And you just fix your own potholes in front of your house. And if everybody has that responsibility, potholes, I mean, there's a lot of us citizens, we could fix it, see? But, so that's what it's saying here, that it's exercised by the whole body of free citizens directly or indirectly. If it's directly... We the, we the citizens do it ourselves. If it's indirect, well then uh, we'll let the representatives deal with it. The legislature and the whole system there of government employees. So we handle it directly or indirectly. But it's the, 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 the key thing that I want you to understand about democracy is that a democracy is the whole body acting together. Okay. Internally, inside this body, you have the individuals voting, but once that majority says whatever it is, then everybody takes the same size, uh, same side, which is now this is how things are going to be. And it's mandatory, okay? That's the key thing. It's mandatory because individuals have no sovereignty in a democracy. So they're subject to whatever the majority vote is. Now contrast that to a republic. Here's, now, these are definitions straight out of Black's Law Dictionary. Not even a good edition, fifth edition, a lousy edition, but we got it out of there. Government, Republican government, one in which the powers of sovereignty are vested in the people and are exercised by the people, either directly or through representatives chosen by the people, to whom those powers are specially delegated. And this is actually covered by a court case. Now, you've got to understand something. The word people can either be plural or can be singular. <clears throat> the word people is not the plural of the word person. Okay? You have one person or many persons with an S. That's the proper usage of those two words, legally speaking, when we're speaking legal English. The word people is either singular. I am a people, you are a people. Of course, you never hear it, so it sounds a little awkward. But the fact is, is that it can be singular. You are a people. Or all of you together are people. Okay? So it's one or more. Now, and each of us is sovereign. And we know this by the preamble. When we created this entity called government, United States of America or California, when we created it, we created the entity. We gave up nothing. So we still have our sovereignty. Now... You can't tell me that my sovereignty does not exist. You see, if, if you try to say that, that the sovereignty of the people is only in the group, what are you doing? You're going back to a democracy. If I have personal sovereignty, then uh, if somebody comes along and says, I must do something, well, where's my sovereignty there? I'm now subject to somebody else's dictates, right? Right? But if somebody comes along and says that uh, here's a new rule, I suggest we all follow it, it's advisory, well, then that's a different story. So we, as individual sovereigns, have no obligation to anyone else other than to not injure someone else and to not invade their sovereignty. That's our only limitation as a sovereign. And so if somebody comes to me or I go to you and say that here's a rule I, that has come up 
you're free in your sovereign capacity to pick and choose what you want to follow and what you don't want to follow. Now, if you choose not to follow it and somebody gets hurt because you didn't follow it, well, that's personal responsibility you're going to have to answer to. Why would you injure that person? Why didn't you follow the rule? You know, it's a measure of responsibility. But it only operates if you injure somebody. So the theory is you could come to a stop sign or come to a red light and, hey, there's no traffic for miles around. It's all clear. Why not go through? In a democracy, you better not go through. In a republic, you say, well, okay, the whole idea of a red light is to, to control traffic to prevent collisions, right? Develop rights of way. Well, there's nobody to yield a right of way to. I might as well take it for myself and go on through the red light. I don't advise that, you know, <coughs> for practical reasons. But the theory is, is that uh, it's all advisory. There's no mandatory. If you're one of the people, you say, okay, I hired these guys called the legislature. They researched it out. They come up with some rules of the road that look pretty good to me. I mean, I do stop at the red light on general principles anyway. You know, it's custom and usage again. We have, it's a modern custom and usage, but it is custom and usage. And, uh, and we all customarily drive on the right side of the road instead of the left side. It has very good benefits. So I don't mind obeying those rules. But I'm doing it because I choose to. And I think it's a stupid thing to give somebody a ticket for parking on the left side of the road, parking the wrong way. You've heard of that, right? That happens. What's the big deal? If nobody was coming the other way, you go there, there's some convenience to yourself, what's the problem? I mean, you, they, they like to say, well, you're going into opposing traffic. Well, what do you think every, you do every time you make a left turn? <laughs> you know, but they haven't outlawed left turns. They've only outlawed parking them facing the wrong way. And they have a specific code which says that you can't park with your traffic, with your car on the opposite, facing the opposite direction, you know. So, um, but in a, in a republic, you should be able to park the car there. Now, if somebody gets injured because you parked it that way, opposing traffic, well, then you have to be held responsible. Although, I don't know how you could be held responsible in a deal like that. You know, I mean, what are you doing? It's, it's passive. You're not doing anything. But still, there's the concept. So, in a, in a republic, the beautiful difference between a republic and a democracy is that a democracy is a dictatorship of a majority... A republic, you're free to pick and choose. Decide when you want to go with the system and when you don't. A republic leads to freedom. A democracy leads to a dictatorship. Okay? In a, in, in, remember what George Bush said? I have a mandate when he won the election. Right? If it's a democracy, he was right. If the determination was that he got the majority of votes... Hey, he has a mandate. That means he's going to push people around. But if it's a republic, whatever he says and does, well, that's just a suggestion. Okay? By the way, nobody's asked me any questions. Usually I get interrupted. Yes, sir? Yeah, we got a microphone. Why don't you come up here and talk to the mic? Well, we have a mic over here, too. Oh, okay, sure. Either way, you can come here or there. Doesn't matter. Right there. Where are you taking most of the stuff you're speaking from? Oh, okay. Yeah, it's a good question. Fair question. Well, you'll find on this disc that everything is supported by statutes, case law, and constitutional law. It's all there. And I'll just give you an example. Do you have a particular thing that you want to challenge that you say, well, okay, how do I know it's true? Well, the whole Constitution has been screwed up right now. I mean, we're, we're living a Patriot law. That's what I'm trying to figure out. Well, you, I, I believe the Patriot Act, if, if it were challenged in court and got to the Supreme Court, would be ruled unconstitutional in its entirety. But, you know, there, there's the practical side. They, the Congress does things, and, the, and they put it into action. And it's not subject to constitutional muster until somebody gets hurt by it. As a matter of fact, we have cases of where they'll take a, a statute and pass it twice under two sections one, and you get one ruled unconstitutional, and then they shift over to enforcing the other one because nobody ruled it unconstitutional. Now, remember this. There's two things that, that we have to kind of keep in mind. One of them is the theory of law, and the other is the practical application. So uh, I, there's a lot of things that are theoretically true, but in actual practice, you get bumps on your head, you know? And it's like one policeman said, 
I think he was a police chief in New York. He says uh, there, there's more law on the end of a nightstick than anywhere else. That's true. Well, what's going on right now, I mean, uh, with the authorities and the Army, now they say they're going to come in with all this flu shots for the birds. Yeah. And, and Bush says he's going to come in now, and he wants to... Uh, quarantine certain sections of the country if it's sure. they find one, sure. one person and they're going to do this and then they're going to ship other people. That's right. You know what I heard? I, I Part of the population reduction program, yeah, right? Yeah, that's what's going Understand. on. But the whole thing of it is, is uh, how are you going to buck this when people are so afraid of everything? You're not. That's it's all point. in the numbers. If you, if, if you have... Look, uh, I, I tell people, look, just do your part. Okay? Mm -hmm. There's 300 million people in this country, approximately. Right. We're approaching it fast. Right. And I can't expect you to do the effort that would add up to what all 300 million people would do if it were, the efforts were put together. You can only go so far in your life. Hey, if you're the only one and the other 299,990,000, you know, if they're not going to back you up, believe me, you've got a dictatorship. So the, 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 the Constitution does not protect you. What protects you right. is the attitude of the people. That's so right. I do my part. I'm spreading my mind poison, okay? You, where, where do you live? What area? In California, Southern California. Well, you want to go on TV with me for hours and hours? I can do it. No, I... It cost you a dime. Okay. Mm -hmm. Thank you for the offer. We'll, I'll take you up on it later. You'll be on seven channels four nights a week. I'll take care of okay. it. I, I'm the executive producer of my own production Okay. Company. Well, we'll have fun. Okay. Thank you. But you see, you're, you're, you are, uh, you do your effort, whatever it is, you each do your part. If we can get enough people doing their part, we shall succeed. Now, how many people does it take to do our part? I'll tell you, I've got the numbers figured out. It's 3% of the population. It's estimated that <clears throat> at the American Revolution, you had one-third who were pro-king, one-third who didn't care, and one-third who were anti-king. Okay. Out of the one-third that were anti-king, 10% of those, or in other words, 3% of the total population, was actually out there doing something, pulling triggers or whatever. If we can get 3% of the population fighting their traffic tickets, fighting the, the cases, do you realize what that would do to their budgets? They get an average of what? Who knows? What, a couple hundred dollars per ticket or 300? Who knows? Something like that. And if it costs them 50000 dollars to, to defend against you when they give you a ticket, that, pretty, that eats up their budget pretty fast, and it takes their time. So I tell people, look, it doesn't matter if you win or lose your case, all right? Of course, you, when you do your case, you're in there to win, but the fact of the matter is, is that they have enough money. If you win or lose, they don't care. Not really, okay? So what's the point? Well, the point is, is do your part, hope someone else is doing their part, and the numbers are growing. More and more people are showing an interest in, you know, they see the problems happening with the, the government, and more and more people are becoming aware. And there's that other group of people who are perpetually asleep. So forget those. I mean, 25% of the people, I think, was, or 30% were absolutely pro-king, okay? Nixon, when he had a tough time, there was 25% who worshipped him. No matter what, what you said, you couldn't say anything wrong about it. So you always had that problem. But if you can get 3% of the population, believe me, you'll see the system change, and it'll be peaceful, too, because they'll be feeling the pressure. Well, wow. Okay, I have you. a really practical question. Let's say you get a traffic ticket. You're arraigned in court on a statutory case. Yeah. What do you plead? How do you do it? Give us the practical ways That's to right. proceed. There, well, first of all, you don't let it get that far. Okay? You... you there's a, a little saying here, which I'm going to put up for you. <clears throat> I think it's uh, under the foundation, is it? No, it's not there. I'm not sure I'll be able to find it. But um, basically, I don't, I don't see it handy here. But anyway, um, there was this fellow by the name of Thomas Jefferson. And what Thomas Jefferson said not in these words, but this is what he said. He said, liberty and ignorance cannot coexist. So you can't, you can't battle these things without knowledge. You must educate yourself. And you've got to have good knowledge. You've got to do it. Liberty and education cannot, uh, or freedom, 
Liberty and ignorance cannot coexist. You have to educate yourself. So you do. And when they attack you, you should know who and what you are. You should know you're sovereign. You should feel you're sovereign. You can't just have an intellect. You've got to be in your gut. Because if you don't really appreciate what sovereignty means, you won't do the right things. But if you do appreciate it, you'll know when to react. I mean, let, let's take, I'll give you an example of what I'm talking about. <clears throat> let's say you're sitting at home. You're watching TV, minding your own business, right? A total stranger, somebody you've never seen before in your life, comes into your house, starts making demands on you. What's your first reaction? Defense. Absolutely, defense, right. Get them out. You'll, you'll immediately, what, what are you doing here? Get out of here, you know? And you'll use whatever's force necessary to get them out, right? He has no business just walking in, not even knocking. Well, see, you didn't have to stop and think twice about that. You had it in your gut. It is part of you. You know where your territorial jurisdiction is. Your home is your castle, and nobody can come in without knocking first and ha getting your permission. You know that. I don't have to teach it to you. Well, when you're in your sovereign capacity and you have a real perspective on where the law is, what's law, what's statute, and where they meet, where the border is between them, and you know when they cross it, you know when to react. The problem is you don't have that now. It took me a long time to get it. It took five years after I knew the concept to really internalize it. Okay? It's not an easy thing. We are so well trained in our slave mentality that... Sovereignty is really a concept that's tough to pick up on. I mean, intellectually, sure, we can see, okay, yeah, the rule says we do not yield our sovereignty. But what happens when a judge says, you've got to do so-and-so? Well, my reaction is, what? You're telling me? Only I don't say that in the courtroom. I have a different way of saying in the courtroom. I mean, this is what I'm thinking. What? You're telling me what to do? You're a judge? Okay? That's my internal reaction. Externally, what I say is, Your Honor, I object. And Your Honor says, Why do you object? And I say, Well, Your Honor, that's not my wish. And the, and the, and the judge says, Well, if that's the best you can do, you're overruled. I say, Well, Your Honor, that is my wish. Okay, for the record. He says, All right, duly noted, and we move on. I never have a court hearing last more than five minutes. I do not talk things. The court is no place for conversation. The conversation that I gave you is all you should ever say in court. Well, there's another thing you could say. When they ask you something, you say, Your Honor, it's all in my paperwork. I have nothing to add. See, the minute you add something, you've created what's called a novation. You've modified your contract. See, you've modified your paperwork and you've opened the way for discretion to be used. But when you say, I have nothing to say, it's all in the paperwork, it's all explained. The answer to your question is in the paperwork. You force them to read the paperwork and it's in writing and nobody can say you said anything different. That's how you keep that under control. But anyway, I, it, what happens is when I leave the courtroom, I go and I type up my order and I serve them with it. I file it in, I serve it. And there they have all the information they need. It has all the information showing them why they're number two and I'm number one. It has all the, it explains exactly what I want in writing. I don't like to talk. Talk, words to the wind. They come and they float away. And who knows what you said. And just because you have a court reporter, you all know those can be modified. So we don't, I don't believe in, in uh, well, I believe in court reporters. We get a lot of good information because once they certify it, that is the record, okay? And so once they certify it, they're on the hook. And you can always get good stuff. Even after they edit it, you can get good stuff out of it. So I used to worry about them modifying uh, transcripts. I don't anymore because they just, I mean, they just cook themselves. You know, there's always something there. So um, with a court, um, well, like I said, <clears throat> I let them know that's my wish. Because you see, uh, I want you to understand something very, very important. This is extremely important. All this stuff I've been talking about all night long, you cannot do if you're a defendant. You must be the plaintiff. You must be the, the counter plaintiff. If you started off as a defendant, you sue, make yourself 
the plaintiff, and then you can start doing this stuff. Because it's the plaintiff that has his own court. You open your own court. You're in your sovereign capacity. And you've got to take that. And the only way you can stop the other court is by challenging jurisdiction. So the number one point in your counter lawsuit is going to be a challenge to the jurisdiction. Now they have to prove their jurisdiction. They can't just assume it. I was in court one time and I said, this was an, a simple case. I didn't go through all the paperwork, but I was verbal. I said to the judge, I said, well, what's your jurisdiction? And he was surprised. He says, my jurisdiction? My robe's my jurisdiction. Real good, strong legal reason, right? So anyway, <clears throat> that's what you run into with these guys. But when you put your paperwork in, you want it to be thorough, explanatory, says why that you're number one. And you take their jurisdiction away from them. And you do it with your counterclaim and in that counterclaim, the challenge to the, uh, the, challenge to the jurisdiction. Their process must stop until they prove their jurisdiction because if they don't prove their jurisdiction, they're proceeding without jurisdiction. That's why they have to stop. Now, as a practical matter, see, that's a theory. Now, as a practical matter, they roll on. So you've got to remember this, that you're going to win your fights in the appellate court, not in the, uh, not in the trial court. Okay? You still have that kind of a problem. Sometimes you run into judges who are very respectful. I mean, you, you give them good paper, they're going to give you good response. Anyway, I guess, did I answer that last question thoroughly enough? Next question. Mm -hmm. Hi, Bill. Um, Hi. I have a question on, uh, is there such a thing as federal common law? And no, no such thing as federal common law. Doesn't exist. No such thing. I know I've heard that phrase bandied around, but it can't exist, okay? Everything has to be in a statute. Everything has to be passed by the Congress. The Congress lays out the, the game plan, and the Congress can only lay out a game plan in accordance with the Constitution. Constitution says specifically that if, it, if the power is not granted by the Constitution, it, it's reserved to the people or the states. It's not, they don't have it. So they are, can only operate by written law produced by the, the Congress. And of course, there's a little bit of flexibility there because you know, they can write a law in such a way that there is some discretion, but they can't go out outside certain limits. Okay? Again, that's theory. We know that we have a runaway Congress now and, and that we have those practical problems. But staying with the theory. You have to stay with the theory because the theory is, that's your structure. That's how you, if you have your theory right, then you can go to some logical conclusion. But if you don't have any theory and you're going to run everything based on practicality and expediency, well, then you have no law system because what's expedient to one is not expedient to another and so on. So you, you have to have a theory. So I always talk about theory and I talk about grandiose concepts and I actually put them in law papers and sometimes they respond, sometimes they don't, you know, but then that's the practical side. So don't think that just because you're right, you're going to be able to prevail, <laughs> all right? That is a problem. Yes? Uh, one more question. Mm -hmm. um, you remember I was dealing with my brother-in-law with regard to some criminal charges? Well, no, I got a bad memory, but okay, go okay. ahead. Okay. Uh, they were going to give him 18 years on two separate uh, criminal charges. Um, two weeks ago, we did end up going in for sentencing. Uh, got it. I eventually maneuvered the district attorney and uh, my brother-in-law's attorney into getting together and bringing it down to eight years. And um, mm -hmm. I ended up putting another document in behind, submitted to the commissioner, and it kind of forced him down to three years. He dropped one of the cases <laughs> and dropped sales on the other one. And sure brought everything down to a minimum of three years. We did do an al he did do an allocution. And because uh -huh. uh, I didn't start out with the um, counter suit to become a plaintiff, from defendant to plaintiff, um, I did use- um, You said counter suit. Did you mean counter claim? Counter claim, sorry. Okay. I apologize. 
counterclaim, and we did use a, uh, a United States Code, all crimes are commercial. So mm -hmm. in effect, I did move into admiralty mm -hmm. in, within the allocution. Mm -hmm. I did put certain sections of it. And all citizens of the United States are commercial vessels, which would be under admiralty. Sure. And it, that basically scared the commissioner, and that's why he ended up with another with that other document coming in, reduced everything down to three years, which means uh, my brother-in-law would do two and a half years. But because of the allocution, even though you don't put everything into an allocution, with the right of appeal, you can still add other areas. Okay. And I'm still wanting to work the common law. I think I did part of it in the common, mm -hmm. in the with the allocution. In common law, can you separate yourself as the living sovereign versus the commercial vessel in admiralty? Well, yes. I mean, you, it isn't that you separate yourself. Or now, look, I know there's a lot of this stuff talk about the straw man. I've never bought into that. And I, I, I have not bought into it for one simple reason. I don't understand it. Okay? So I, I haven't picked up on that at all. So I'm not saying it's right or wrong, but I know... I don't, I don't uh, understand it, I haven't picked up on it, and I don't need it the way I do it. Okay, because what I do is in my counterclaim, and this is important to do a counterclaim, you're actually suing back, and, you can, and you're challenging jurisdiction. You can also put in other claims for your injury, but you're suing back. That's the important thing on jurisdiction. And I start off saying I'm one of the people of the jurisdiction, like one of the people of the United States, and I say it's a court of record. And with those two things, I've established who and what I am and what the forum is. So I have yet to any, have anybody ever file in their papers, that doesn't mean it won't happen, but I've never had anybody say, oh no, you're not one of the people. I've never had anybody say, oh no, this is not a court of record. And you gotta remember, there's a fundamental rule in court proceedings. If you fail to object, it means you agree. Right? Everybody knows that rule. Well, it applies here too. And so, this is so innocuously stated, okay? They really don't understand the importance of it until it's too late. Now they can't suddenly say, oh, well, uh, we forgot to object to that. Well, you didn't object timely, sir. <laughs> you see? So, now, to answer, get back to this first question, uh, is there a federal common law? The answer is no, there's no federal common law. It's all statutory as far as what they do is concerned. However, the Constitution of the United States specifically says in Article 3, and I think I, I always get them confused. I can't remember if it's Section 1 or Section 2. But it always says, it says in there that the judicial power of the United States is available in all cases at law and equity. Well, at law means common law. So, and it goes on to say where the case arises under the uh, uh, Constitution or statutes of the, of the United States, okay? Now, what this means is, is that you suffer a wrong. And so you would probably sue for a trespass or trespass on the case. Those are both common law causes of action. But what's the specific thing that happened to you? Well, they had an obligation to follow this rule. They broke that statutory rule, which re resulted in a common law injury, and I'm suing for my damages. Okay? So I can sue under the common law, and, and I can decree in the suit that in this particular case, the statute, that particular statute is the law of this case. Okay? So once you've done that, now, you go, you go through the process when you get to the end. If you win, if you get the judgment, it's a judgment out of your common law court. In other words, at law. The judicial power of the United States is now available for enforcing the judgment. See? So you have the federal power available even though there is no federal common law. It recognizes the common law of the people. That's the connect right there. Now, what is common law? I went through a little bit of that before, but I left out an important thing. Common law 
means the common law of England as it was in 1789, okay, when the Constitution came into effect. So if you look back, we'll go to the foundation here, and we look up the Confirmatio Catarum, okay? Now the Confirmatio Catarum, well, let's, to give you a perspective here, um, sorry to make you stand there, but, but the Magna Carta, the Magna Carta came up in um, 1215, the year 1215. Sometime later, we had the Confirmatio Catarum, and the Confirmatio Catarum, which was also in the 1200s, that uh, recognized the Magna Carta, and the Confirmatio Catarum from King Edward I directed all of his uh, subjects that if you are one of the accused and if you choose to demand that the Magna Carta be treated as the common law, then the Magna Carta is the common law of England. Okay? Now, if you don't demand it, they cannot force the Magna Carta on you to accept it as common law. So it's totally under your control as to whether or not the Magna Carta is common law. And so the Confirmato Catarum and the Magna Carta, or at least variations of it, were in effect at, in 1789. So here's where we look at the Confirmato Catarum. And it says right here, you go to the end of the first paragraph. Here it is, number three. And this is the king speaking, okay? He's writing here. And he says, and that our justices, sheriffs, mayors, and other ministers, which under us have the laws of our land to guide, shall allow the said chatters, charters pleaded before them in judgment in all their points. That is to wit, the great charter as the common law. And the great charter is the Magna Carta. Okay? So the, his, his minions must accept it if you demand it. That is the common law. So that's the link. The Constitution of the United States says, recognizes the common law. What is the common law? Well, you go right back to 1789. Confirmato Catarum was good law then. That makes the link between that and the Magna Carta. And you can say, hey, the Magna Carta is common law. The Magna Carta is pretty good. One of the things is, you look in the Magna Carta, and it specifically says that a free man, that the, that the that the king cannot issue a precipice so as to cause a free man to lose his court. And that's what I've been talking about all evening is my court, okay? Your court. So, can't issue a precipice. A precipice is an order to show cause, okay? It's an order to show cause issued against property. By the way, your rights are considered property, okay? So, that's, that's the link. That's what the common law is. Now, if they don't challenge it, you don't have to bring it up. Uh, by the way, that brings up another point. Ben, uh, Abraham Lincoln, he was a lawyer. And he said, if you don't want to uh, argue a point, don't bring it up. Okay? We tend to overwrite our papers. I know I do. I have to go back and edit them. But we tend to overwrite. So don't go into all this... I know, you, you'll see it. You look at a paper, you see people say things. If you said you're one of the people of the jurisdiction, you've said enough. You're sovereign. You don't have to say you're sovereign. You are sovereign. Okay? And they won't challenge it. They never do. Maybe they'll start if they ever get one of these tapes. Okay, yeah. Thank you for your patience. Um, when you challenge this lawsuit to become the plaintiff and you're... Um, mm -hmm. you know, the first thing you do is you, you challenge the jurisdiction. Can you sort of end it that? Can you just start with that? Or do you have to, like, answer all the complaints that were in the original document? Well, uh, as a strategy, you never point for point answer their accusations. Mm -hmm. Okay? That's a bad strategy. Why? Because they've defined it for you. Mm -hmm. See? What you do is you tell your own story. You let the court sort it out, okay? Mm -hmm. You just tell your own story. You say, here's where I was, here's what I was doing, uh, and uh, this is what the other guy did. He's a bad guy, you know, for whatever. And, of course, you're suing, okay? So you're asking for damages of what he did. 
and you're asking for compensation for your loss of rights because of the fact that you were uh, taken into custody without authority, you never say false arrest. Mm -hmm. Don't use the term false arrest because if you acknowledge it's an arrest, that gives it legitimacy. But if you say you're taken into custody, see, taken into custody is one thing. False, uh, an arrest is something else. An arrest is what you get after the custody happens. Okay, I mean they occur at the same moment in time, but you, you, the actual action of taking your body into custody, that's neutral, it could be right or wrong. But once it's an arrest, that means, or the word arrest implies a certain def definition of legitimacy. And if you say false arrest, well we sort of understand it, but you gotta remember courts don't think that way. <clears throat> so you wanna be at the get-go, you wanna use the right words. And one of the things we did, like in one case, um, we said that this person had been taken in, into custody and uh, she was uh, taken into custody and carried away against her will. Okay? And then, uh, in the beginning, we said that uh, uh, we put the plaintiff's name and then he said in parentheses, here and after plaintiff. And uh, with one of the people of California and in this court of record complains of, and then we listed all the defendants. And we had a whole bunch of defendants. We had like uh, four judges and, and uh, half dozen prosecutors and, and we sued the, the public defenders too because they were there uninvited. They were helping to carry the system through. And we said all that. And then we said here and after and we gave them a name and we called them kidnappers. Now, you understand, we didn't say they were kidnappers. We just said that's their other name by which we're going to refer to them. <laughs> and throughout the paper, we always call them kidnappers. Okay? In your papers, you want to give facts but not conclusions. If you do give a conclusion, make sure it's a conclusion that the reader obviously arrives at anyway. And so that, that's a basic technique. But you, you, uh, you can label them any way you want. So, hey, it's good writing to say these kidnappers did this, that, or the other. Have you been involved in vacating any judgments that <coughs> resulted as being be because, I mean, they didn't have the jurisdiction in the first place? Yeah, we just issued a direct order called a writ of error. Ah, okay. Yeah, take it out. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> You're welcome. Any other questions? Yes, sir. Not so much a question, but Bill, I'd like to thank you for making us all think a little bit. I, I've fallen Great. into the... Uh, you're welcome. Thank you. Well, I, I hope you make use of those CDs because, and then there's the website. The website is always being updated. So, you know, but it's nice to have it on your CD. This, this CD, let me tell you a little bit about, may I? Do I have time to tell? You, you want to put up with me a little bit? Let me just say one thing. Uh -huh. um, after you made your comment about the sovereign citizen, I've, I've gotten lazy the last couple of years Mm -hmm. When the subject comes up, I just say, uh, I'm a card-carrying sovereign citizen. After you made that statement, I got to thinking, I, I look, sovereign person. Well, that's the same thing. <laughs> it's, it's like sovereign citizen, that, right. Is that, uh, I thought maybe yeah. that would solve the problem. No, no, a person, a, a, a person is somebody who is defined by law. Okay. Whereas people... So I should change this. Yeah, the people create the law. And then after that, persons and citizens, there's certain words that all mean the same thing. Now, the word person has to be taken in context. The word citizen has to be taken in context, too. That's the problem with it. People is not in context. People is very plain. All I do, the reason I use the word people is because that's the word that's used in the preamble. Sure, there's other things you could say, but again, I want to minimize argument. I'd rather win than fight. So... Uh, it, I don't have to explain it when I say people. I just say, well, it's, I'm one of the people as contemplated by the uh, preamble. Okay? That's all. I'm a people. I don't have to explain it. Just like I don't have to explain the Constitution. Okay, that word is self-defining. Well, I would say that you just say that, uh, well, first of all, you could do that. Okay? You could say that you're one of the people of California. That should be good enough. You don't even have to use the word sovereignty because it's already in the statutes. It's already there. Let me show you something that you have on this, uh, on this uh, 
uh, disc. Okay, here we've got to bring it back down to size again. Okay, we have reference law books on here. It's quite a few reference law books. You have 300 megabytes of information here. It's almost 400. Okay, we have the California 1849, the California 1879. We have the entire California code on here. You also have the interlink, the internet link to the California code if you happen to be on the internet. Uh, <clears throat> we've got the Constitution for the United States of America, okay, because that's what it is. And then we have a 2,700 page book on here called The Constitution of the United States of America Analysis and Interpretation. That's a great book because guess what? It tells the truth, believe it or not. It tells the truth. And who publishes it? The United States Senate. A free copy is given to every senator, every congressman, and in the executive branch, a free copy is given to the vice president of the United States. The president doesn't get one. Anybody know why? Very simple. The vice president is the president of the Senate. So he's part of that organization. He, he's the tiebreaker. You got 100 people in there voting. If it's 50 to 50, he'll break the tie. And it has happened. So the Constitution of the United States of America, analysis and interpretation. And I got a link to the current one if you, if you want. OK, we have all of Title IV, Title 18, Title 26, and Title 28 of the United States Code. If that's not enough, we've got an internet link to the United States Code. <clears throat> got the Northwest Ordinance. That's the one that says that uh, all the highways uh, leading to the Mississippi are free. I don't know if anybody's argued that one, but I suspect all toll roads are illegal. They're illegal if the government has its hand in it. <clears throat> that's just a suspicion. I haven't really checked that out. Uh, we have the Anti-Government Movement Guidebook. <clears throat> that title tends to give you the wrong impression. This is a book written by judges and judge-hired consultants trying to figure out what you and I are all about. This is their guidebook to figure out what the anti-government movement is about, and we're not anti-government. That's one point that they miss. At least I'm not. I'm pro-government. See, my theory is this. I own the outfit. And I share that ownership with you. We're each tenants in common. So we're each 100% responsible for it. That's what tenants in common are. And so we have this, this ownership. I'm not here to buck the system I created. I'm here to make it work. And if there's something that's not working, I want to change it. But there are certain people that, through my organization, I've hired. And they abuse the authority that you and I have granted to them. And that's what I'm against. I want them to obey the law. You'll notice that the motto at the top, okay, through, our court, through the courts, encouraging the government to obey the law. See, I'm not here to fight. I'm here to win. And I want, I want everybody to win, and I want the government to win too, but honorably, not, not some of the garbage that we see going on. It's very important that we be informed and have a clear view of our own mission. That's why I'm so friendly toward these people. Hey, if somebody's doing their job, Wonderful. And I, I'm not against the vehicle code. Although I think it's uh, a fraud upon most of the citizens when we say that driving is a privilege and not a right. Okay? Driving, the word driving is a commercial word. We the people granted authority to the government to regulate commerce. Great. Now stay out of my hair if I'm a, an individual. You know, not in commerce. We have, everybody, I think, understands that driving is a, the whole driver's license thing is a commercial thing. Okay? And if you look under the uh, Title 18 of the United States Code, Section 31, it says right there a motor vehicle is a uh, contrivance that's self propelled that's used in, in commerce. And then it further defines used in commerce, meaning carrying passengers or cargo for hire. That's all a motor vehicle is. So I do have a license to drive a motor vehicle. However, if I'm not engaged in commerce and I get a traffic ticket while I'm minding my own business, just traveling, where's the jurisdiction? Even if I have a little piece of paper, they have no jurisdiction. And remember, you can be a sovereign for some purposes and not a 
sovereign for other purposes. You can enter contracts. It's okay. I've got contracts with the government. Okay? I have a social security number. I do have a driver's license, although it's signed without prejudice. But even if I didn't sign it without prejudice, it's only commercial. It has nothing to do with travel, right? So if an issue does come up, I'm prepared to do a battle. Okay? So you don't have to be. Let me show you the controlling case on that. That's okay. What you do is you, you, you do what you did, exactly what you did, and they reject it. Say, they're not going to let you do that. We're not going to do business with you. Well, then what you do is, you, you, and you have a couple witnesses with you, okay? They saw what went on. After that's all over, you have them make up affidavits that they saw this. Then you write a letter to the Department of Motor Vehicles, and you tell them what happened. And by the way, this letter is also an affidavit, okay? Statement of truth. All affidavits are affidavits of truth. You don't have to say they're affidavits of truth. They automatically are. So you have an affidavit saying exactly, you approach the clerk, you put the clerk's name in if you got it or whatever, and then you let the clerk know, you, I'm, I'm sorry, you let the DMV know after you've received your driver's license that it was your intent all along to do this without prejudice. And you just let it sit. They'll probably throw it away but you have your certified copy or registered mail or something to prove that it was sent to them. Somebody served it for you, you don't mail it yourself. You, you know how to do service, you, you pretend it's a legal paper and you have somebody serve it because they are your witness that it got delivered, see? You cannot be your own witness when it comes to service. Yes? Sure. Okay. I don't know. He says that you had to come back eight times to have your photograph taken, and you want to know why. I haven't a clue. They like you. That's a, you you've got a great face, and, and they just, you know. Look, a photo session. Well, every photo session, I know you take hundreds of pictures before you get the one you like, so maybe that's what they're doing. You've got a photo session going. But, you know, seriously... Uh, whatever the reason is, you know, at some point you're going to get tired of that crap. You're going to let them know, and they're causing you an injury for whatever reason. You have to define what that injury is. But, you know, if they're, because of their screwing around, instead of following their own system, they're abusing their authority, and now they're causing you certain real losses because you're, you're conforming to their demands. Okay. But anyway, go back to this uh, without prejudice. You send that, this story to them, and it sinks in. Now it just sits there. It's a bombshell. That's basically what it is. Because someday, well, a little bit more here. Under the law notes, we have a procedure. And it's called notice and demand. Okay? You go to the notice and demand, and in the notice and demand, we have a checklist of eight items. Okay? And when you send them that letter, you use this as your checklist to write to this letter. But in this case, you're not making a demand, even though this is called a notice and demand. In this case, you're just informing them. And you inform them what your intent is without prejudice. Now what happens is they don't, they don't reply. In all likelihood, they're not going to reply because all they want is collect your money and have you have the driver's license. See, that's the game they're playing. But then one day, you have to show up in court on these issues. And you say, Your Honor, I have no contract with the state. You don't? What's your proof? Well, here's a letter I sent them, and here, you can have a copy of it for the court. And it says right here that this is my position, and I gave them 30 or 60 days to respond, or 90 days, whatever, you know, and they never responded. So I proceeded as if they agreed, since they failed to object. And I let them know what my intent was, and they understood it. It was without prejudice. So. You see, even though they refuse to let you sign without prejudice, your intent is there because part of your story is, is that you let them know right from the get-go. You see, the UCC does not allow them to refuse. Not really. UCC 1207, the 1207 says that you can say in a contract that you can preserve your rights by saying either under duress or without prejudice. Those are synonyms. And it also says, or words to that effect. But don't do words to that effect because then you have to argue over the meaning of the words. Okay? 
whereas here, without prejudice and under duress, those are already defined statutorily. So you just say, look, I let them know right from the get-go is without prejudice, and they ref the clerk apparently didn't understand what the UCC was, and I couldn't convince her, so I proceeded, but I immediately notified the powers that be up in Sacramento that this is my intent, and they never answered. And I gave them fair time to, so they, it, it, my position is recognized by them. I mean, they had notice, and they failed to object. So therefore, it's true, because I told them it was true. See, right here, you look at number uh, six. I think it is. <clears throat> no, number seven. If he does not do as demanded within the allotted time, then by tacit procuration, you will determine for him the facts, his duties, and the damages he owes you. Tacit means by his actions, you know what his intent is. And you just tell him, look, if you don't reply in 10 days, which you gave up earlier, or you don't, well, I give him 60 days, says the government, okay? Then you don't reply in 60 days, well, then, uh, Hey, then I'm going to assume this is what your intent is. And look, Your Honor, they were served. There's no contract here. And here's the traffic ticket. I signed it without prejudice also. And after I signed it without prejudice, the policeman wouldn't let me, so here it is. It's scratched out. But that was my intent. Yes, sir? It also depends on the clerk, He says, also it depends on the clerk. You got to talk in the microphone, I guess, because a short sentence I can repeat. Yeah, a short sentence I can repeat, but a long one, we got to get you up to the mic. Uh, when I went to the last DMV, I put without prejudice UCC 1 207 on it. She said, um, What is that you're putting on there above your name? I said, oh, Without prejudice. She said, Oh, that's so nice. <laughs> got it right back. <laughs> Very good. That was really nice. You know, you're just a nice guy. I can see that. That's great. <laughs> yeah. I don't have any prejudice, right? That's good. <laughs> now, let me tell you something about UCC. You should all know this because I see this running throughout our community that, we, that a lot of you don't realize what UCC is. Now, first of all, I don't know much about the UCC. I only know the big picture of it, of what it's about, namely law merchant. And the other thing I know about it is 1207, okay? Now, but here's what happened. <clears throat> the 50 states all got together in a big powwow, and this big powwow lasted several years. And they worked out a set of rules, which they came to call the Uniform Commercial Code, okay? But this group was just that, a group. It was a committee. That's not the same as a legislature. And then after they, they worked out there, whatever they're going to work out, they then said, here it is in a book. They published the book and they said, here's the Uniform Commercial Code. Do not use that book because that is not the UCC. Okay? Now what happened after the meeting was over, actually it's an ongoing meeting and they always revise things, but after their, they produced the book, each of the representatives returned to his home state and gave a copy of the book to the legislature. The legislature then studied it with their committees, and they said, hmm, we like this, but we don't like that. And so they modified it. Okay, every state modified it in its own way. Some things they accepted, other things they rejected. And you have no way of predicting which way a given state is going to go. Now, when they published the books for general purposes, you know, for the general public, they have tables in there showing right near the front of the book, or maybe it's the back now, but they put in there which of the UCC got accepted and which got rejected or which was modified. Okay, there's tables in there. You have to look them up. But <clears throat> it's handy to know what to look for, at least, because it's documented in a lot of different ways, indexes and this type of thing. But in California, the UCC is known as generally as the commercial code. And the original commercial code got replaced by the UCC, and the state, the, the state of California legislature modified it. So you referred to 1 207, but in California it's known as 1207. They dropped the dash out. Okay? Other states changed the dash to a period. 
and I don't know, there's other variations. So you have to, it, whatever state you're in, you have to look and see what your particular legislature adopted and what they rejected. But in California, it's, it's called the uh, commercial code. If you're citing it, you cite it as the uniform commercial code. And when you're, doing, when you're in a California case, you're writing California court papers, when you refer to it as the uniform commercial code, that is the commercial code of California. It's legal to say uniform commercial code and it's understood to mean, it's not just understood, it's legislated that this is what it means. It means the California commercial code. Here is, as a matter of fact, we can go to the reference law books. We'll go to uh, the California code, okay? And then here is the commercial code, the UCC, okay? And then we go to the very first uh, text, section uh, 1101, I think. Yeah. Yeah, the entire California code, not just the commercial code, everything. The whole thing's in here. It's not necessarily up to date, but it's good for a guide because on this disk, there's a link to the California reference, and you can get the latest there. Okay. And it says here, this code shall be known and may be cited as Uniform Commercial Code. But see at the top, it says California Codes, Commercial Code. Okay? Make it bigger, I guess. I guess, did that fit? No, it doesn't quite fit, but anyway, there it is. Okay, so it, right at the top it says California Codes, Commercial Code. That's how they, that's the short form, but the long form, you call it the Uniform Commercial Code. And there is a 1207. If we go to 1207, went too far. There it is. Okay, section 1207. A party who with explicit reservation of rights performs or promises performance or assents to performance in a manner demanded or offered by the other party does not thereby prejudice the rights reserved. Such words as without prejudice, under protest, or the like are sufficient. And by the way, subdivision A does not apply to an accord and satisfaction. That's another little thing you should be aware of. If you got a case going and they say, all right, we're going to plea bargain, and you settle for that, that would be an accord and satisfaction. So saying, I'll go without prejudice into a plea bargain and settle that way cancels out that concept of without prejudice. Okay? Now, having said that, what if you're in a position where you have no choice? You, the, the judge is asking you, are you doing this voluntarily? And you say, yeah. Of course, what's the alternative? You're going to jail, right? <clears throat> well, you're not got, you don't have full and free, even though you're saying so. And so you could do without prejudice then. Or maybe the record shows that, you know, like we have this one case where the judge said to the person, uh, to the defendant at that time, and later she became the counterclaimant, but the judge said, uh, you're under my jurisdiction whether you like it or not. And in another case, another judge in the same case said, uh, after, after she objected several times, she, he said to her, there's no point in you objecting anymore. It's not going to do you any good. So those are clear statements of prejudice, so we're going to have fun with that. The yeah. case is not over. She did a plea bargain, but it was after we had him surrounded. Okay, well, anyway, any, anything? Yes, sir. Uh, that brought up a question. I was not aware that the Uniform Commercial Code mm -hmm. was not put together by the U.S. Congress. Uh, right. Could you shed a little light, a few facts on who these persons or bodies were and in what year or years that this happened? And well, first of all, I can't answer that question directly. I mean, they, they, if you look in the big book that they publish, it tells you when they had their meetings and what years and that type of thing. You can get that information there. But clearly there was some central sponsorship here, and it most likely 
officially came through the Bar Association. That would be my guess, and that is a guess, okay? But and or the the uh, Congress could have uh, passed, uh, um, could have funded the meeting and said, "We will pay the expenses of everybody showing up so we get this done." But that doesn't make it law. That's just the committee output. But I'm wondering if they have any claimed any basis for uh, having the authority to put this together uh, on any level if they weren't elected members of any state or representatives of the federal government or anything. You know, where, where did they claim to have the right to do what they did? Well, first of all, let me start it backwards. First of all, what they did, the work output of that committee has no authority. Right then and there, it's nothing, okay? It still had to be carried back to the states and the states individually pass it into law or into codes. Uh, secondly, who funded them? I don't know, but it's very conceivable that Congress could have funded it. Congress funds lots of things. They have grants all the time. So they do grants. They give grants to organizations to accomplish one purpose or another. So who all was involved, I don't know, but that was probably the mechanism. There's probably federal funding. There's probably state funding, too. You know, it was a pretty well-organized uh, thing, and there's a lot of good stuff in the Uniform Commercial Code once you really understand it. Uh, so, so bottom line is I can't answer your question in detail. I just know that it's not unusual for the government to do grants. I suspect that if you really push the point, grants themselves are unconstitutional. I think if you know the story about the sock dollager, you ever heard that story? Okay. And uh, that was a pretty clear statement, I thought, about the government not having authority to engage in welfare and such. But uh, they're doing a lot of unconstitutional things. We just can't be everywhere to challenge everything. Okay. Is that it? Well, okay, folks. I hope you uh, get some good value out of that disc. Thank you. Thank you. Appreciate that. Here you go. And, yep. In a Mac, it'll mostly work in a Mac. If you have, if you have a problem with it in the Mac, go into the actual folders and see what the capitalization is like. There's a sometimes there's a mismatch between. The, the web page that's calling for it and what the file really is. And the Mac okay. seems to be case sensitive. Okay. And I've tried to fix those things, but that is, that is the one failing. Other than that, it should work because it okay. uses the regular browser. Okay. I may be able to get it onto something. Yeah. All of this is, it has the, uh, they're either PDF files, RTF files, yeah. or, you know, so. Great. Yeah. Great talk. Did I understand that when you said about the 12, 1207 on your, on your uh -huh. driver's license. Then they give you a ticket and you sign the ticket without prejudice. Right. Uh -huh. And you're saying you're not entering into that contract of your own free will. Yeah, reserve, you're reserving your rights. So now when you go to the arraignment or whatever they call it, now mm -hmm. you appear for the ticket. Yeah. What happens? Well, you can argue that there's no jurisdiction. See, the minute you make your plea, you've granted jurisdiction. Right. So if you don't plead, mm -hmm. you're guilty or not guilty. No, you're challenging jurisdiction. But you see, you should do a counterclaim. You should sue back. Okay. okay. As long as you are the defendant, you're in their jurisdiction. So, and there's even no, there's no jurisdiction. Yet. Even when you're not in their jurisdiction, you're in their jurisdiction. Just because see, you show up, you're in your jurisdiction. Yes. You, you could you show up. Well, you see, one of the procedures you can go through is called a special appearance. Yeah. Well, but who makes the decision as to whether or not they have jurisdiction in a special appearance? They do. Of course. So they really have jurisdiction. See. And it, uh, so you have to do a counterclaim, set up your own court, and now you're bringing them as defendants, counter-defendants, into your jurisdiction. And you're saying, what business do you have violating my space? So just, just by showing up in the arraignment, you're still winding up going through their ball game. Yeah. Yeah, that's the way I look at it. Well, no, that is what it is. Yeah, you're in their jurisdiction. Even though I signed without prejudice, here I am. Uh, yeah. And I don't go in there to say I signed Yeah, but by the time you show up, you should have had a counterclaim in there. Yeah. And all I asked for was a verified complaint. And they didn't even provide that. No. You know, what, so, yeah. 
Ms. Ramp. Thank you so much for coming to the Granada Forum tonight. And let's give one more round of applause to Mr. Bill Thornton. The Granada Forum will be back on December 8, 2005, with Mr. Lindsey Williams. Thank you so much for attending the Granada Forum, and God bless.